Poole of the Council of the District of Columbia. I'm Phil Mendelson, Chairman of the Council and Chair of the Committee of the Whole. Today is Thursday, January 21st, 2021. The time is 1.12 in the afternoon. And this hearing is being uh, held virtually over the Zoom video conference broadcast platform. It's also being broadcast on Council Channel 13. It is also available on the DC Council website, which is www.dccouncil.us. And I believe it may also be uh, streamed on Facebook. Excuse me, on YouTube. On YouTube. Uh, the subject of this hearing is reopening District of Columbia Public Schools. I'm gonna read from the hearing notice. The purpose of this round table is to hear from District of Columbia Public Schools from DCPS leadership on the proposed plan to increase the number of students who will return to in-person instruction for term three. Term three begins February 1st. This roundtable will be an opportunity for DCPS leadership to provide clarity on a plan to move forward with and improve distance learning while welcoming students back to in-person instruction safely during the pandemic. In addition, DCPS has announced the launch of their Reopen Community Core, a diverse group of school level stakeholders that convenes at every elementary school and will support and advise school leaders in understanding learning models and impacts on the community for reopening. The Committee of the Whole would like to hear more about the outcomes of the Community Core across district and its impact on DCPS's plan to partially reopen on February 1st. We had a deadline by which witnesses had to uh, sign up to be able to testify. And we also indicated in the hearing notice the number of public witnesses would be limited. We have 50 witnesses who are registered. I think actually it's 49 because several dropped off. And I'm hopeful that we will have about two hours at the end of this hearing, which is scheduled from one to six. About two hours to hear testimony from the chancellor of the public schools and I'm told that about five o'clock will be a representative from the Department of Health. So that if uh, council members have questions concerning reopening and public health guidance with regard to the schools, uh, there will be somebody from the Department of Health uh, late in this hearing. Uh, I'm gonna recognize other colleagues if they have opening statements, which I would appreciate if they would be kept brief. And then I will call the first 15 witnesses. Uh, Councilmember Gray, do you have an opening statement? You are muted, Mr. Gray. Am I unmuted now, Mr. Chairman? Yes, you are. You are unmuted now. Well, thank you very much. I uh, I want to uh, express my appreciation to you for calling uh, today's roundtable, which I view as one in a logical series of roundtables uh, concerning the uh, state of public education uh, during this public health emergency and global pandemic uh, on distance learning, reopening schools and the return uh, to in-person uh, learning. I think everyone would agree uh, that in-person uh, education is more effective, uh, but it must be done in a safe manner and in a way uh, that is transparent and earns the trust of all stakeholders, uh, especially uh, our students, uh, their families, and the teachers who are instructing them. Um, as DCPS now uh, plans to have in-person learning uh, for all grades uh, starting in the third term uh, in the midst of uh, rising rates of uh, COVID-19 uh, na nationwide, uh, today's roundtable is especially uh, timely. Uh, I want to thank today's witnesses uh, for their continuing engagement, um, and I look forward, Mr. Chairman, to uh, hearing about, discussing DCPS's plans and their pre preparedness for uh, serving our children once again uh, in their schools. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilmember Gray. Councilmember Trayon White, do you have an opening statement? Yes, I do, Chairman. Thank you. Um, uh, returning to in-person uh, instruction is a delicate issue. Uh, it's important that we strike a balance uh, and weight the weight of value between safety and students and teachers and the education of our students. Uh, we already know the experts have been warning us that COVID-19 cases will continue to rise and that we should prepare for dark days ahead. I believe I read something that said uh, there were 400,000 deaths as relates to COVID across the nation and 
25 percent of those happen in december um and so as we think about those statistics we have to be very cautious and careful of how we move forward uh we we witnessed a, a increase during the holiday season um, we also know that the vaccines are becoming available dc health only anticipates that they will be able to have availability for teachers on january the 25th uh, what happens if they're not available on that date we know that immunity is not immediate and what about the students even with the safety precautions in place on school campuses we have seen that these particular practices are not fail proof um, the availability of a rapid COVID-19 tests on campus for students as staff are showing symptoms are helpful to help them get out of the class immediately, but what kind of uh, preventative measures will be taken? So I have a lot of questions um, and concerns. I heard from parents, teachers who are uncomfortable at about returning to in-person instruction, and there are those who uh, are eager to get back to in-person instruction and who are not doing well doing um, digital learning. And so we're just trying to figure out how do we transition. Um, and so I'm eager to hear from those stakeholders today and my colleagues, and also I hear you said Department of Health, um, but we have to have a healthy balance to ensure that we can prepare for quality and safe education here in the district. Uh, I look forward to hearing. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councilmember White. Councilmember McDuffie, if you have an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do uh, briefly. Uh, I want to thank you for holding this uh, some public roundtable, and I know that we're here to hear from uh, parents and teachers and, and other members of our school communities. Uh, and, and I look forward to, to doing that. During the previous council period, uh, back in October of last year, uh, you all held a hearing of the committee to hold, and it was, you know, I think productive in the sense that we got to hear from folks, but I think that the same questions that were raised then and in many accounts still remain true now. And I think there's still some answers that, that folks are looking for. Uh, at that round table, I urge DCPS to model its reopening plan with an eye towards racial equity. I also urge DCPS to engage more with the public and stakeholders to provide greater transparency around their decision-making processes. I think a successful reopening plan is one that prioritizes equity and builds public trust uh, through engagement and communication. Uh, I think that uh, while some strides have been made, I think uh, I know that the chancellor, our teachers, both in DCPS as well as in DC public charter schools uh, have been working with parents and students uh, and my colleagues tirelessly to try to prepare for uh, in-person learning. And I know that we're all doing our best uh, in each of our respective corners to help each other through this, uh, this pandemic. Uh, I think sometimes we get it right and I think sometimes we miss the mark. I think there's some areas that uh, we have not yet covered that we need to. Uh, and just as everybody's been impacted by this pandemic, some have been impacted more than others. And so we need to make sure uh, that we're doing everything that we can to address the challenges that are facing uh, our students and our parents so we can get them back to in-person. I think that everybody would agree that in-person learning is the best setting uh, for our kids to learn. And so uh, this is a very important discussion that's going to happen today. I look forward to hearing from all the folks who signed up to testify. And I look forward to hearing from uh, DCPS about how we're going to do better for our children, our parents, and our teachers uh, in our entire school community. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilmember McDuffie. Councilmember Lewis George, do you have an opening statement? Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Chairman, for, for hosting this, and I, I will keep it short. Um, but, you know, I, I do think it, it says something that uh, we're holding this hearing remotely um, while requiring our teachers to return in-person learning assignments in, in less than two weeks. Um, and I want to express my gratitude um, for our teachers and school staff and healthcare workers and families, um, and, and particularly our students, um, for their strength in this difficult time. Um, you know, I was pleased to see Tuesday's announcement of the partnership with Children's National Hospital to begin offering uh, first round dosage to DCPS teachers and support staff. Um, but I'm interested to learn more about how DCPS is planning to keep families and staff safe uh, during this reopening. Our current uh, daily case rate is above 20 new cases uh, per 100,000 residents, which puts us in the CDC yellow or uh, category of transmission in schools. Um, a recent uh, study looked at what to what extent in-person schooling contributes to the spread of COVID-19 uh, in both Wish Michigan and Washington State, and researchers have found that opening schools in areas 
with greater than 20 new daily cases per 100,000 students, increased case counts in those communities. Um, we've seen from the case notific notification letters that were sent home by DCPS, uh, that already even in limited care classroom offerings, dozens of letters have gone home to families sharing news that someone in the building has tested positive for the virus. Um, so I'm interested to hear about specific community spread metrics DCPS is using to evaluate whether it's safe to reopen schools and whether to keep them open. Uh, we've seen others in our region, we talk about a regional strategy, we've seen others in our region like Montgomery County recently pulled back from reopening in the midst of uh, COVID spread. Um, and when I say specific metrics, I, I don't mean CDC guideline, guidance or Aussie health and safety guidance because I've looked at those uh, and they don't include specific community spread metrics on which to base decisions. I'm talking about things like Alexandria City's decision matrix indicators. Uh, which were transparent science-based metrics used to inform whether or not it's safe to open schools. Um, and so I've heard from families and staff, and I know that this is a complex issue, uh, but I want to make sure that we are opening schools uh, when it is safe, uh, and especially when our teachers and educators have the opportunity to receive the vaccine, and we know that it can be effective. Um, I look, thank you for uh, allowing this hearing to happen, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Janice Charge. Uh, Councilmember Silverman. If you have an opening statement. Yes, uh, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chairman, and good afternoon to my colleagues, and certainly uh, to all those who are testifying today. Uh, I see there's a large number of participants, Mr. Chairman, and that is because how we reopen schools uh, and when we reopen and what fashion we reopen is one of the most critical decisions that we need to make uh, during this pandemic. And I think the community involvement uh, in this hearing uh, is indicative of how important it is. Um, we need to make this decision not only as a government, um, but as a community. And I will just note that I I think the community's uh, uh, participation and perception of our reopening process so far has been chaotic, uh, not very transparent, um, and one in which information is often limited and hard to decipher, uh, and that needs to change. Um, in two weeks, um, in less than two weeks now, we'll be bringing back students and teachers um, to every school in the system. Um, and I just want to note, because I don't think it has been uh, noted by colleagues, that the uh, parent surveys, uh, the community surveys of DCPS do show a deep divide. And, and the divide is often by race and by ward in uh, the parental willingness and, and interest in returning to in-classroom learning. And I think we need to understand uh, this better. Um, you know, meanwhile, some of our public charter schools have started school this year in person, um, and while others have remained virtual. Uh, and, what, and again, uh, I thought the point of our charter experiment was to sort of understand, use them as um, experiments and understanding. And I'd be interested in knowing, for example, what's worked and what hasn't, uh, but that information hasn't been that plentiful either. Um, I'll, I'll just say, Mr. Chairman, I know that your focus on the on the education committee uh, or uh, putting education within the cow is really to do oversight, which I agree with. So I have a lot of questions, and I'll just put those up front. And, and it gets to some of the things that Councilmember McDuffie was talking about with equity: who is being served in person, who is uh, learning at home, what you know, looking at the demographic data there. Uh, are our public schools doing enough to support uh, students furthest from opportunity? Uh, what have we learned about how to support students through this pandemic? As, as was noted, a lot of students are still going to remain uh, in a virtual learning environment. So how can we improve that? And certainly, what have we learned about how to keep our students, family, and staff safe? Um, I will just note that on the chaotic nature of reopening and the lack of information, um, you know, it was news to me that DCPS um, 
had three schools, Brent, Ross, and Kimball in Ward 7, um, that have brought some teachers back uh, before the February reopening in an experiment. What have we learned from this? Uh, I'll be asking the chancellor about that. Um, I think my colleague, uh, Councilmember Lewis George, noted um, the number of cases in our schools, which is uh, concerning, even with this small pilot of the uh, in classroom uh, learning. So that is very concerning too. And I'll just say, Mr. Chairman, a final note, I, I'm going to have to leave because somebody who has been in very much involved with this discussion, unfortunately, was um, died of COVID. Um, I'm talking about someone you know very well, Mr. Chairman, Andrew Washington, um, who represented uh, some of the workers who, who are in our schools, uh, not teachers, but some of the other uh, workers in our schools. So, you know, the stakes are high uh, and th this is a deadly virus and we need to keep that in mind. So uh, I apologize to those who I will not be able to see. I will be probably gone for about an hour from the hearing, but look forward to rejoining when I get back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilmember Silverman. Councilmember Robert White, if you have an opening statement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I, I associate myself with the comments of, of my colleagues. You know, at this uh, point, the decision has been made to reopen schools on February 1st. Uh, so, so this hearing is, is not about whether or not we should reopen. Uh, however, uh, we do have to recognize the reality of, of where we are. Uh, we are seeing our, our highest spike in COVID cases. We are seeing a high number of deaths uh, from, from COVID and we cannot and should not pretend that that is not happening. Uh, that said, there are a number of parents who need to uh, return their kids to, to in-person learning. Uh, however, I continue to be concerned about the significant divide in, in parents who are comfortable returning to in-person learning because it doesn't reflect a need to have students in school. What it reflects is a lack of trust uh, that, that people have um, in, in our schools. And what we have not done over the past months, despite all of these fits and stops uh, on school reopening, is build that trust. So the, the reason that parents are so hesitant by a majority to send their kids back to in-person learning is because we have not developed uh, their trust. And what we keep doing is just keep pushing forward with in-person learning. Let's you know, develop a plan, let's make it happen. Uh, what we have not yet done is really built that uh, base of trust uh, for, for our parents. And that is uh, regrettable. I, I still think that um, we should have had a more focused uh, reopening uh, with the classes of students that absolutely need to be uh, in the classroom, students with high special needs, students uh, who are English language learners, uh, high at-risk students who don't have supports at, at home and use that population to build trust, to let people know, you know, what the metrics are, are showing, uh, what the school uh, operations look like. Now, however, we have not done that. Uh, we are moving to in-person learning at a time where the majority of parents have indicated that they do not want to move to in-person learning. Uh, so what I think that we are challenged to do here is to, to make sure we are very transparent with what we are seeing uh, on the ground uh, that we are transparent with the protocols that uh, we still don't know. Uh, I still don't know, for instance, uh, what will cause a school to close. I still don't know why so few students and parents uh, took the opportunity to join the CARES classrooms uh, or what we have seen in terms of those CARES classrooms closing uh, as a result of uh, COVID exposure. So there's a lot that we don't know. Uh, we are all in this together. I recognize, as I'm sure all my colleagues do, that there are no perfect answers here. We are all trying to figure it out together. Uh, but, but I hope that there's a, a level of transparency and cooperation from uh, DCPS and from our charter schools that will allow us uh, to really move forward uh, with, uh, with, with education in the city during COVID. Uh, so I have a number of questions, mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman. I will be uh, absent for part of, uh, for some of the witnesses, uh, but I will be present for the majority of the hearing. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councilmember White. At this point, uh, we'll proceed with uh, witnesses. I may have said I would call the first 15, I'll call the first 13 which is page one of the witness list. Uh, Emily Gasoy, who is uh, the Ward 1 representative to the State Board of Education. Fraser O'Leary, who is the Ward 4 representative to the State Board of Education. 
Jessica Sutter, who's the Ward 6 representative to the State Board of Education, Ebony Rose Thompson, who is the Ward 7 representative to the State Board of Education, Carlene Reed, who is the Ward 8 representative to the State Board of Education, LaJoy Johnson Law, who is a Ward 8 mom and disability advocate, Patricia Stamper, who is with Empower, is an Empower Ed Fellow, Laura Fuchs, who is a teacher in DCPS, Tina Thompson, who is third grade elementary teacher in DCPS, Elizabeth Davis, who's the president of the Washington Teachers Union, Zachary Carroll, who's uh, listed as a public witness, Samantha Bertocci, who is a teacher, and Tony Ann Meniscalo, Meniscalco, I apologize, who's with DCPS. I'm assuming a teacher or an employee. Just give a moment. Uh, if you would limit your testimony to three minutes, and if you look in gallery view on your screen, you should see a clock at the top, which has the time, will show how much time you have left. Um, and I will cut folks off if they go on too long. Uh, we'll begin with the uh, State Board of Education representatives, uh, Emily Gosoy, and good afternoon. Good afternoon, and thank you, Chairman, for um, giving me this opportunity to testify today about DCPS reopening efforts this school year. Um, my name is Emily Gassoy, and I am the Vice President and Ward 1 representative on the State Board of Education, as well as a parent of a third grader currently learning remotely at Yu Ying Public Charter School. While my statement today draws on the testimony of State Board public witnesses, I am testifying on my own behalf and not on the state uh, for the State Board of Education. Since June 2020, the State Board has heard consistent testimony on reopening from over 250 public witnesses. Two very clear messages have emerged from that testimony. First, teachers do not feel safe to return to school buildings in person, and they feel that their well being and professional ex expertise is being ignored by system leaders. Second, Families and educators across the city want outdoor learning options. So I am going to address these two related issues in my testimony today. So first, the testimony that the state board members have heard from educators over the past several months has been wrenching. Since receiving notices that they will have to return in person for term three, whether they are ready or not, teachers at our January public meeting pleaded with DCPS to postpone in-person reopening for term four when they, when they have had, until they have had the opportunity to receive their vaccines and sufficient time has been given for vaccines to take effect. At a time when COVID-19 cases are on the rise and a new more contagious strain is predicted to hit the US in the coming months, it does not make sense to risk even one unnecessary infection when the vaccine makes it preventable. While steps were taken to address some of the flaws in the term in the term two plan, distrust still remains as DCPS teachers are being compelled to return in person without their buy-in. There are many recommendations for reopening better, but if system leaders hope to begin to repair trust, agreeing to allow schools to develop their own reopening plans uh, and timelines and allowing teachers to be vaccinated before returning in person would be two essential steps in the right direction. Another important piece of the puzzle in repairing trust would be to offer support for schools to develop plans for outdoor learning options. There is strong scientific evidence that being outdoors greatly mitigates the spread of COVID-19 virus. This has been recommended by uh, Dr. Fauci, the CDC, and in addition, outdoor learning has been shown to improve student engagement and academic outcomes, as well as physical and mental health of students, teachers, and staff. Outdoor learning could help to address the learning loss we know is happening, um, as well as the array of, you know, social, emotional, and mental um, uh, issues that students are facing due to isolation and too much screen time. Um, I did submit my written testimony, and I see that my time is up. So I am going to skip to my recommendations, but I do 
urge you to ask me questions about outdoor learning because it's something that I think is not being uh, taken as seriously as it should be. Um, and our mayor has given restaurants $4 million to reopen uh, outdoor seating so that diners feel safe. So I strongly urge the mayor to do the same for our schools so they can offer safer options for our students. Um, and I just echo everything that you know, we heard from our council members in opening statements. I recommend that, you know, we give schools the option to reopen, um, to create their own plans that will be more sustainable. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gasoy. Uh, Treasurer O'Leary. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm testifying today, not only as a member of the State Board of Education, but also as a parent and an educator. The reality that I'm testifying online rather than live in the council chambers is a constant reminder of the situation that the virus has brought and continues to bring to us every day. Nothing is normal. There is no new normal. We should not be interested in going back to what it was before last March. We need to do everything to make our children's education a new reality when it is safe to go back inside of our school buildings. If your constituents cannot go to your office, then schools are not a safe place either. If we can't go to a movie, a play, or a game, then schools are not a safe place either. I have five adult children who hopefully have made and will continue to make mature decisions about staying safe during this pandemic, and I worry about them every day. Even though the COVID-19 rates are higher now and show no signs of abating, DCPS is contemplating opening schools in less than two weeks. What kind of message is this to the children, parents, and educators of our city? Several of the members of this council do not have children yet. Several of you have adult children and several have young children. Would you send your child to school at the beginning of February with the virus still spreading, knowing that our children want to be with their friends who might be asymptomatic? My wife was a Head Start teacher who understood that young children needed attention and a warm hug frequently. I taught seniors at Cardozo High School, and I know that seniors have trouble following rules that adults make anyway. How can we allow students back in the buildings without all of the adults having been vaccinated is beyond my comprehension. Teachers will supposedly begin to be vaccinated on next Monday. If every teacher that is told to report on February 1st is vaccinated next week, then the earliest time that those teachers can have the next shot is two or three weeks after February 1st on the 15th or 22nd of February. That is a big if. No schools should be open until all the buildings, both government and school buildings, are deemed safe for everyone and the employees are vaccinated. Do not let our children be pawns in a grown-ups game. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. O'Leary. Uh, Ms. Jessica Sutter. Thank you, Chairman Mendelson and members of the Committee of the Whole for this opportunity to provide testimony on the reopening of our schools. My name is Jessica Sutter and I'm honored to represent Ward 6 on the DC State Board of Education. I first wanna offer appreciation for the work DCPS has done these past few months. Offering schools choice about how to best bring some students back in person has been better received than the previous one size fits all plan. However, the shift towards more school level decision-making seems to have solved one problem and created another. Some schools in Ward 6 have strong, clear communications and families feel well informed. Others feel like the lack of clear plans from DCPS directly have left them in the dark as to what is happening in Term 3. I am also grateful for the bright spot of vaccination priority for educators. However, while Mayor Bowser announced earlier this week that DCPS and public charter school teachers will be able to get vaccinated beginning January 25th, she did not announce a timeline of access for childcare workers. Many childcare providers have been working in person throughout the pandemic. 
I hope the council will push to ensure that the teachers of our youngest children are vaccinated concurrently with K-12 educators. Since nearly all who testify today will offer feedback on the current plans for DCPS, I'd like to take a different approach. I urge council to begin asking now, what are plans for supporting students this summer? Furthermore, what efforts are underway to design plans for next school year? Asking these questions and getting answers now is imperative if we're to avoid the frustration and distrust that has marked the past months. Families and students will need support this summer. What in-person options can we make available for all students? How can we maximize parks and recreation space throughout DC to serve students outdoors? How can we harness community partners to ensure that options are available in every neighborhood, reducing need for transit? How can we work with organizations families already trust to serve their children every day? Next year cannot simply be a return to what we knew as normal last March. As poet Amanda Gorman said yesterday, we will not march back to what was, but move to what shall be. How are we thinking about preparing to meet students at varying levels of academic readiness for the next grade? How are we preparing to deal with trauma students have experienced? How are we preparing now for a return that needs to include both in-person and virtual options? I know DME and our LEAs, both DCPS and charters, have worked tirelessly to prepare for return to school buildings. But council must ask now about plans for what is truly the not so distant future. Operating in crisis mode is sometimes unavoidable, but it is rarely in the best interest of our students and families. You have the responsibility and capacity to serve our education leaders and to urge them to shift their energies now to the essential recovery period ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sutter. Uh, Ebony Rose Thompson. Good afternoon, Chairman Mendelson, um, and to all the members of the council in attendance. Um, as always, I appreciate this space to bring our perspectives and concerns. Um, my name is Ebony Rose Thompson, and I'm honored to represent War 7 on the State Board of Education. I want to start by offering, it's not really a question of if we want to reopen schools, but when and how do we do it safely? I have yet to meet anyone that doesn't want schools to open. I've heard though from students, families, and their educators that they miss what school was like before the pandemic. I've also heard from those same people that they are still concerned it is not safe enough to return. We just like the rest of the world are counting on a Swiss cheese model to defend ourselves against COVID-19. In any setting, there are inherent risks and safeguards in place to mitigate dangers. These safeguards are like layers of Swiss cheese, barriers against infection with holes, some personal and some systemic. None of the solutions are perfect. And if we don't take the appropriate combination of steps, we risk greater exposure and greater infection um, by COVID-19. In addition to us effectively using PPE, um, social distancing and outdoor education as solutions, I'm both excited. There is an opportunity for teachers to receive vaccinations beginning on January 25th and concerned we are missing the opportunity to do better by our students and educators. We heard many testimonies at our state board meeting earlier this month um, from educators concerned that we return to in-person instruction safely. My mom, who apparently is on this panel today, surprise, uh, is one of the educators um, returning to her classroom in February. She is like many other teachers, uh, missing her students and wanting them to be safe. But being fully able to effectively vaccinate our teachers before they return to in-person classrooms um, must go a long way to ensuring teachers, students, and their families are safe. In order for the vaccine to be effective, it requires an incubation period of three or four weeks, depending on which version of the vaccine one receives, followed by a second dose to ensure effectiveness. That will leave our teachers returning to in-person instruction vulnerable for several weeks. Additionally, it is reasonable to show concern given the acknowledgement in the mayor's announcement that DC needs more vaccines. And essentially, we may not have enough to go around. Coupled with the supply and demand issues with the rollout difficulties, we continue to see getting our seniors and worth seven appointments. It is clear we may not be able to meet the goal of vaccinating our essential workers. Finally, it feels insufficient to say there's a huge missed opportunity in not providing the vaccine to childcare workers and students, given they are also entering the same environments. I know we've pushed the day for school reopening before, 
which is particularly difficult and unfair um, for families trying to plan for themselves and their children. Our decisions must be tied to metrics and science. I must wonder if given the opportunity we now have to vaccinate our school communities and the safety of returning to in person, if delay is in our best interest and not allow the safest and, and to allow the safest return possible. Beginning to vaccinate teachers is good. Fully vaccinating our teachers before they return to in person is better. And I'm testifying today in hopes that we can work with you to do better. Um, thank you for the time. I look forward to any questions. Um, and I'm happy to share kind of experiences as a community core member um, for several DCPS schools in Ward 7. Uh, thank you, Ms. Thompson. Uh, Dr. Carlene Reed. Greetings, Chairman Mendelson, Ward 8 Council Member White, Council Members present and staff. I am Dr. Carlene Reed, the proud representative of Ward 8 to the DC State Board of Education. This summer was filled with rallying cries of only when it's safe, led by many in the education community. We are on the cusp of entering a year into this pandemic, and instead of getting closer to reduce community spread and safer public spaces, we are seeing similar numbers. We're seeing numbers very similar to the height of the pandemic. With the varying needs of our students, families, educational professionals, and community members, I ask us as a city to collectively rally behind a new mantra of make it safe. This will include a variety of mitigation strategies, including reducing public access to non-essential points of community spread, such as restaurants and office buildings, providing maximal support and attention to essential points of community spread, which include childcare centers and school buildings. And these are according to the current numbers that are on um, the uh, COVID website on DC. Um, increasing access to vaccinations, continued implementation of social distance pro protocols. Additionally, innovations in education should continue to be explored and funding um, funded, including outdoor learning and maximization of distance learning. This testimony contains two sections. The first is my review of Ward 8 DCPS's school reopen checklist. I also included River Terrace um, educational campus in the Youth Services Center um, because of um, the, the populations. Um, the second portion of my testimony just has general mitigation strategies um, based on the State Board of Education testimonies, um, stakeholder engagement, Ward 8 families, community members, and education professionals. Um, on review of the Ward 8 COVID-19 plans from individual schools, there are two repeated things for items still labeled as in progress. Those items include the portable HVAC filters, as well as access to drinking water and or hot water for hand hygiene. I would note that the secondary schools in the ward have quite a few li items listed as still in progress. One school mentioned underlying heating and electrical issues that need to be addressed to support the added layer of COVID-19 protocols. That school is Henley Elementary School. I also know that this school's hot water is still listed as in, as in progress on the DCPS website. Um, and that's actually a school that's open as a, a, a POC. Um, moving forward in the testimony, also I think our early childhood education classrooms may need additional supports that are not addressed in the checklist, which include nap time, toileting, and PPE. Um, given the rest of my testimony um, in regards to mitigation, I say provide the community, um, the education community in its entirety, access to vaccines and time for the vaccines to take effect. Systemically thinking, the city may need to consider the access of vaccinations to families who choose or need to send their children to in-person learning. The city should also think realistically about the government's, the federal government's impact um, on its slow rollout. Um, and lastly, I'll conclude, um, based on the feedback from some Ward 8 families um, in regards to what will make them feel safe when explicitly asked, um, they um, listed um, vaccinations, smaller classroom sizes, and significantly fewer positive COVID-19 cases um, were all cited as common themes that will make those families feel safer in regards to returning. I lost the timer. Am I over? Okay. Um, and I would just also like to throw in about bus. I haven't seen much about busing um, in regards to our transportation methods um, in the CDC. In my testimony, I listed out exactly what strategies need to be listed in regards to Aussie transportation. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Reed. Is it Joy Johnson Law? Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Um, good afternoon, Chairman Mendelson and Committee of the Whole. You all can hear me, right? Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Oh, perfect. All right. Good afternoon. And my daughter is sitting here right beside me. So if you hear little things happening in the background, just, 
just just don't pay it any mind. But good afternoon, everyone. My name is LaJoy Johnson Law. I'm a resident of the Great Ward 8. I'm an education and disability, av disability advocate, but most importantly, I'm here as a mother. I'm here to share the voices of my Ward 8 community and families that are, that are unfortunately not able to be here before you today. Um, I want to first recognize and honor all the families, students, and teachers mm -hmm. that continue to persevere during distance learning, but there is so much that we have to do. And the first thing is we must recognize that there are so many families and so many different situations, mm -hmm. but the majority of our community still feels it is not safe to physically return to school. If families have to sign waivers for their children to go back to school, then it is probably not a good idea to send children back to school so that way, so that way someone is not liable in case something happens. Just saying. Um, so our students and families and teachers east of the river and honestly all over really need to be heard and prioritized. And honestly, we're just not. Um, we don't really trust what's happening. We don't trust the information that's coming because there hasn't been um, just clear, clear communication. Communication has been all over the place. So today we call for the council to acknowledge and to implement the following. And I know I, my time is limited, so I'm just gonna go over them briefly. One, we still need to mandate a collaborative safety plan for both DCPS and charter schools and the early childhood centers. We need to have a coordinated response um, to reopening for all families because many families have children in all different sectors. Um, also, the numbers are still rising. Um, I refer you to the coronavirus DCPS um, updated data. Um, also, um, in regards to outdoor learning, um, like Bean. Dr. Gasoy said, if we can have $4 million to open restaurants, then why can't we have $4 million um, for emergency funds for out outdoor learning? Budget season is upon us, and I think we do need to implement um, a $4 million plan strategy. Um, in addition, we're calling on the council again to provide I oversight and to help ensure teachers have access to proper vaccinations. Um, I think Dr. O'Leary said it earlier, we're talking about returning on February 1st, but how many folks really have access to, to, the, to the vaccinations and why are our teachers not um, deemed essential to make sure that they are safe? Hold on, Abria. Mommy's almost. Mommy's almost done. Okay. Um, also, um, we're also. I think this is a, a good opportunity for the council to look into um, mandating a new online distance learning plan, um, so that way students have another option um, instead of just going in person. And then also, since we do not have an education committee anymore, um, we're advising that the, that the council. Um, can be an advisory education committee made up of families, teachers, um, schools, and students to advise on reopening and other education matters. I see that my time is my time is up, and um, I'm here to answer any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, and thank you to your helper, Patricia. Good afternoon from Ward Seven. Um, my son is also here with me because he goes to a daycare in Ward Eight. He had to be picked up early because because of COVID, any little thing that goes wrong with your child, you have to pick them up early. However, thank you, Chairman Mildeson and council members for granting me an opportunity to give a public testimony regarding the reopening of DC public schools. My name is Patricia Stamper and I'm a ward I'm a resident of Deanwood Ward 7 neighborhood. I'm also an empowered Ward 6 fellow. Also, my oldest son is a DC public school student in Ward 5. And lastly, I'm also a DC public school employee serving students and families at Minor Elementary School in Ward 6. Mama! Yes, yesterday Mama! I took my children to an outdoor learning opportunity in Ward 8 at Oxen Run Park. My children were able to participate and engage with other students in a safe, open environment. I would like the DC Council to con seriously consider outdoor learning options as other DC residents and colleagues of mine, LaJoy, Carleen, and other people have mentioned for DC public schools reopening. DC Parks and Recreations has several turf fields that can be utilized in conjunction with DC public schools for outdoor learning classrooms. The District of Columbia also has several alleys and parks and open spaces throughout our city that can be refurbished to be utilized as outdoor classrooms. By utilizing outdoor spaces, COVID-19 will not be easily transmitted to DC residents, DC public school students, and DC public school employees. When I put my, I knew as a, as a result of being classified as a special ed paraprofessional in DC public schools, I knew for a fact that I was going back to school before everyone else, because we were, um, the mayor wants to return all the students that were high at risk. Those are students that have IEPs and 504s. I work directly with those students. However, my child has IEP. 
I declined his seat for, for a care classroom Amen. because he has asthma. He's only had one asthma outbreak since March 13th, and I'm very thankful for that. I would like to recommend that DC public schools consider using, like, utilizing a year-round model to address learning loss and also utilize a rolling arrival schedule for employees and children and, their, and staff. Because if my son's daycare now does not open at 6 a.m. and now opens at 8, I now, in order to return to in-person learning, I have to get a, um, an accommodation from my supervisor, thank you, Bruce Jackson, for allowing me to arrive 30 minutes later so I can drop off both of my children accordingly. Once again, thank you for my testimony, and I'm, I'm open to take questions, recommendations into consideration. That's, that's Patrick Stanley. Uh, thank you, Ms. Stamper and Mr. Stamper. Uh, Laura Fuchs. Thank you. Um, I'm asking to please make sure DCPS delays the reopening until the health metrics regarding community spread are 100% in phase two. All building staff are fully vaccinated and have had necessary time to build up immunity and all the components of the WTU memorandum of agreement are fully met. In DC, the statistics surrounding the pandemic for the past few weeks do not look good. And with the second strain being identified in Maryland, we have to make sure that we are being extremely cautious that all the plans for reopening are being done in the safest possible manner. DCPS has not yet fulfilled that standard, nor have they demonstrated that the risks to the frontline staff would be taking, justify the academic gains and family demand for in-person instruction. DCPS central office has applied their past strategies to extended day, extended year, LEAP, and other initiatives to their reopening plan. Please note that both extended day and extended year programs were largely ended after a few years, and I have not seen any tangible evidence that they made the gains that DCPS claimed would come. Step one of their plan. The mayor makes a press conference about a grand plan alongside the chancellor during the school day, and not a single union is consulted in advance regarding its contents. This usually involves a PowerPoint with limited details and bold claims. Step two, the mayor has a local schools figure out the rest. This will be accompanied by a claim for local flexibility that usually does not actually provide much flexibility. For example, at my school, our initial submission for reopening plan was rejected, causing a new plan that nobody on the reopening committee asked for to be implemented in its place. Step three, in a tepid propaganda campaign that ostensibly asks for feedback, but really is just more opportunities to repeat the talking points from the press conference. Few additional details forthcoming. Step four, blame local schools, unions, principals, teachers, parents, and or students for anything that doesn't work and go back to step one for a brand new press conference worthy plan. These steps aren't great in a normal year, usually causing chaos, breaking up school communities, exacerbating teacher staff turnover, etc. But in a pandemic where lives are literally at stake, they are completely unacceptable. DCPS is doing everything backwards and has not produced reliable data to demonstrate that all of this time, effort, and true anguish are worth it. DCPS needs to prove that the following with documents that the unions who work for them can review and confirm accuracy for. One, what is the actual demand at each school for in-person instruction? Follow up, looking at care classrooms that use the actual use of those seats versus who said they'd claim one. Two, what is the academic need that is being addressed and an in-person plan and does it match that demand? Follow up, what level of disruption, i.e. changing teachers, larger class sizes, more asynchronous days for the students, et cetera, the plan create? There's a whole bunch of other questions like has it met the memorandum of agreement? What's the lag time between positive COVID tests? And I'll just send you the written testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fuchs. Uh, Tina Thompson. Hi, good afternoon. Um, my name is Tina Thompson. Thank you, Chairman Mendelson, for having us here today. Um, and thank you all members of the council that are present. Um, I am a parent of not only Ebony Rose, but I'm a parent of a um, high school senior this year. Um, I live in Ward 7. I teach school in Ward 7. However, my daughter, who is 17 and is a senior, she travels across town to 16th and Aspen Street to go to school. Um, one thing I think that we need to take a look at is that 
with the vaccine becoming available on January 25th, and we all have talked about the timeline of how long it takes for <clears throat> that vaccine to actually activate within your system, why are we rushing to put people in danger before making them safe? Um, the next thing that I wonder is that um, since schools have adjusted to distance learning and DCPS, and I, I teach for DCPS, DCPS, as well as um, my daughter who goes to a DC charter school, she goes to DC International School, um, they've done a pretty good job with adjusting to distance learning, just like we're doing a pretty good job with adjusting to having our large meetings and gatherings online. Um, anytime we step outside of our bubble, then we are putting ourselves at risk. DCPS is asking their teachers to step outside of their bubbles and not only take, um, take in, taking care of, like, so bottom line is taking care of our family. We're caregivers, we're parents, we have families. We then, we step into a classroom and right now with in-person learning, they're only suggesting that no more than 11 children are in a class. So you're stepping into 11 families bubbles then you also are increasing the amount of students that are being serviced during distance learning. Those class sizes are growing astronomically. Um, I can say that I volunteered to go back in after finding out that we were being forced to go back in and my two colleagues on my grade level are one has severe asthma who, has, who takes breathing treatments and takes care of an elderly parent the other one has two young sons under the age of five. She has twins. They are three years old, three year old twins. So I, it's like the Hunger Games, and it's like, okay, so you're the, you're, I'm like the least at risk, even though I'm at that age where I'm at the most at risk. DCPS has not even offered teachers a early retirement. You know, um, it doesn't make sense if the world is on pause for this virus for us not to pause education. Learning loss, we can recover. Life loss, we cannot. So we need to think about that. And then we talk about the social emotional being, social emotional, how much social emotional well-being do we see when we tell children they have to stay six feet apart, that they have to stay six feet apart, not only from themselves, but from their teacher. That's not socially emotionally sound. And how can we expect them to do that when we can't expect the grown-ups in the grocery store, the restaurants, walking down the street to follow those same health guidelines? It's more like you're, we're asking children to come back to school so that we can torture them. It does not make sense. And you're asking teachers to come back to school so that you can torture us or so that we can lose our lives. You can get sick or lose your lives. Everyone does not recover from this disease and we do not know the long-term effects. Ms. Thompson. I thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Elizabeth Davis. Thank you and good afternoon, Council Chairman Mendelson and other members of the council. I'm Elizabeth Davis, president of the Washington Teachers Union. Uh, and I'm going to have to leave immediately after my comments to attend the funeral of one of my colleagues, Andrew Washington, who died from COVID, uh, basically uh, the representative of the paraprofessionals union. I'm encouraged um, about yesterday's inauguration and also about this hearing today, this reopening hearing. I'm hoping that this hearing is going to signal that the committee of the whole will take seriously the many challenges facing our city. The work ahead is daunting, but our city is plagued by large opportunity gaps that continue to exist. These are gaps basically that has grown the achievement gap. Immediately before us is our challenge to safely reopen our schools. You've listened to testimony from parents and board members and other teachers, so I'm not gonna reiterate the comments that have already, already been made. Um, we basically have focused our attention on solutions, working with DCPS to safely reopen the schools to make information transparent, all instructions to parents and school workers clear that has not happened. Despite our desire to return to our school buildings and see our students, many teachers are frightened. They are frightened about the disease that has killed many of our colleagues and over 400,000 American citizens. They're frightened that they'll bring this deadly disease back to their families. 
and, and, and of course to the families of their students. In December, in an effort to clearly outline the conditions that the WTU believes need to be met to facilitate a safe return to our school buildings, including a school readiness checklist that would ensure every opening school building would meet strict safety conditions. The WTU and DCPS agreed to a memorandum of agreement. We had hoped that the agreement would mean that DCPS would move forward in partnership with us, with other workforce and community partners, sharing data and information that we, we need to enable a safe return to our schools. However, the agreement has done little to change the conditions on the ground. I, I, I basically um, have continued to have the same questions and concerns raised with Chancellor Furby and his team. Every two weeks we meet with him. Earlier this week, the WTU had to send a letter to DCPS requesting expedited arbitration on our concerns around the city's failure to meet the terms of the memorandum of agreement. And we thought that this was a very good agreement that took us at least nine months to, to develop. The list of demands is included in my written statement, which I'm not going to go through here. The two most significant concerns are that DCPS continues to withhold data around family demand for in-person learning uh, and has continually failed to provide the documentation needed to ensure our school buildings are safe. So we are urging the council to require DCPS to work with us to provide the information that teachers and families need so that they can confidently return to in-person learning. Teachers understand and sympathize with parents who want to return to in-person classrooms as our teachers wish to do. Distance instructions could never replace in-person learning. We know that. We understand the social and developmental concerns facing our students and the distance environment is not the same. However, as educators, our obligation is to serve our students, to educate them and help ensure that they can live happy and fulfilling lives. We also have to have an obligation to provide and protect them from the ravages of a deadly virus. So we're asking that the council look closely at the plans. If the plan is being, that, that is being currently proposed actually serve those that are furthest from opportunity. And why are we rushing so many individuals back into our buildings when we're just weeks away from ensuring they're protected from this deadly disease? We believe that the re response will be eye-opening. So thank you for the time. I look forward to working with you to protect our communities and ensure that every student receives a high quality education. And we are hoping that the plan for reopening is not going to exacerbate the inequities that already exist in our school district. Thank you for allowing me to speak and I will stay with you as far as long as I can to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Ms. Davis. And I do have a couple of questions for you, but you will stay for the uh, for at least another 10 minutes? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Zachary Carroll. Good afternoon, members of the council. Uh, thank you for holding this hearing today. My name is Zach Carroll and I'm a Ward 6 resident and Ward 2 middle school teacher. I'm here to testify before you today because I love teaching. One of my favorite parts of working with young people is supporting them to increase their capacity to stand in their own truths. One observable way this shows up is that they feel comfortable either embracing or pushing back on peer pressure, whether in the classroom, the lunchroom, or the bus stop, seeing young people take or refuse actions based on their own set of evolving values is inspiring. I returned back to my house today at 1255 just before this hearing for my grandmother's funeral. She died on Monday evening, um, 118, and she tested positive for COVID on January 6th. Her death has reshaped my words today. I had planned to provide what I hoped would be an eloquent testimony based in facts, science, and moral grounding that would convince you, our elected city councilors, that this plan is not only wrong for our students, educators, and community, but that it will cause harm. But now, quite honestly, I don't really know which pleas to make. I ask for your caring, your support, and your action. Please care about the unnecessarily dangerous position DCPS is putting our community in with its poorly conceived plan. My plea is for your help standing up to what I can only describe as a bully. But unlike my middle school experience, the bully isn't here to take my food or push over my notebook. The bully is here to discard my life and diminish my humanity. We, DC residents, teachers, and community members need your questioning minds, your oversight powers, and potentially your legislative powers. We need these privileges to ensure that we do not see the eventual and inescapable consequences of DCPS's current reopening plan. As is, the plan would cause an increase in COVID cases, COVID cases hospitalizations, and deaths. The plan will make teachers flee for neighboring districts where leaders display empathy and understanding. And the plan will force educators and staff to return to the classroom with terror and trepidation, not excitement and vigor. 
If we're going to achieve our goal of reopening schools that are warm, joyful centers of engagement and learning, we need educators who want to be in those reopened schools. In this moment, and I'm speaking for more educators than just myself, it truly, truly feels like top officials at DCPS and the chancellor do not care if I live or die. Let that sink in. The person in charge of managing education for the 50,000 plus public school students does not care if his teachers live or die. I'm sure he'll say otherwise, who wouldn't? But months of bad faith bargaining as evidenced by perb rulings, intentionally manipulative and misleading infographics, legalese emails, and sham reopening cores prove to me that they do not care. If we want to rebuild trust, if DCPS wants to demonstrate through actions that it values this teaching workforce, the chancellor will back down from February 1st. On February 1st, under DCPS's current vaccination plan, zero teachers will have received both doses of the vaccine, zero. Today, I eulogize my grandmother. DC City Council, it is up to you now. No health metrics will convince the chancellor and his officials that it's not safe. Simply, they do not care about these metrics. If they cared about the metrics, we would find defined and measurable metrics somewhere in the reopening plan. It is beyond clear to me that no number of potential eulogies will make the chancellor change his mind. How many eulogies is too many for the council? For you, Chairman Mendelson, for uh, council member Pinto who represents my school ward and council member Allen where I live. You can help. You can save the lives of DC residents and community members. Ask the chancellor today, what considerations would make him change his mind? Are there any? You can request and then demand that DCPS makes its data public, particularly its, particularly its facilities data. Request and then demand that DCPS not reopen until teachers and staff can be fully vaccinated. Ask the chancellor how many teachers will be fully vaccinated if we waited a few more weeks until March. Mr. Carroll, you're a minute over your time, so I'm gonna to have to stop you. Apologies, thank you, Chairman Mendelson. Thank you. Uh, Samantha Patochi. Hi, um, my name is Samantha Bertaki, and I am a Ward 7 resident and a Ward 1 teacher. Um, I am in my car right now. You might not know this. It is not because I zipped out for lunch. It is because I am helping to facilitate the delivery of assisted communication technology to one of my students. I have seen tremendous progress for a lot of my students during distance learning. The reason I have seen this is mostly because of a small class size. So while I have nothing to add in terms of the medical or the scientific side of things, a lot of the people who've testified before me have done a great job about that. And at the end of the day, I'm not a doctor. I'm just a lady who spends her day with puppets. This is Leo. He came to cheer me on. Um, I want to urge the council to think about the instructional implications for the students who remain virtual. We have seen in data, including data from DCPS, that Black students, Black families, and students east of the river are more likely to choose to stay virtual. They've also been, as Councilmember McDuffie stated earlier, disproportionately affected by this virus. If we want them to have the best educational experience possible, that's going to require a level of flexibility and support that a teacher who is suddenly teaching 30 students cannot provide. In any setting during a pandemic, our teachers are going to need to be flexible and we're going to need to be supportive. We are going to need to give our students things that we did not need to give them before. They are experiencing loss in ways that as a child, I never had to navigate. And now that's our reality. So one way we could avoid things like the rapidly ballooning um, class size is to honestly ask families if on insert date here, let's call it February Schmerst, um, indicators are at specifically this and these state safety measures have been met. Would you want your student in school for X number of days with a teacher who meets X criteria? It needs to be specific and something that families can measure. Additionally, it needs to be something that the vast majority of families are engaging with. That means that it cannot just be in an email or via text. It has to be a way that all of our families can access if we want to know how we can best support the most students possible. Um, thank you so much for letting me speak today and um, I appreciate being here. Thank you, Ms. Bertaki. Uh, Tony Ann Miniscalco, I'm told is not here. Uh, 
so members will have five minutes for uh, questions. I have several questions. Um, I will begin with this. Um, Mr. Carroll, Zachary Carroll, you were testifying with regard to the metrics and following the metrics. Maybe I don't have a question here. Um, we are having, at the end of this hearing, the chancellor testify. We always, we try to put the executive at the end of our public hearings. Um, and I've also asked that a representative from the Department of Health be present. So there'll be an opportunity for us to ask questions about um, how public health metrics or public health um, uh, expertise is comfortable with the schools reopening. Um, Ms. Sutter, um, you in your statement asked for the council to have a hearing or rather the council to begin asking now what the plans are for supporting students this summer. Uh, well, this isn't directly on point, but we are looking to schedule a hearing next month on learning loss and how to overcome learning loss. So. Um, the date has the hearing notice has not yet issued and because our uh, hearings are limited to three hour slots, uh, we may have to limit the amount of public testimony. Uh, we are particularly interested in hearing expert testimony. When I say expert, I mean folks who are professionals in the field of education to uh, give us ideas on how um, uh, public education can overcome learning loss that we're sure has occurred. Very glad to hear that. Ms. Davis, Elizabeth Davis, um, we do not have a copy of your statement. I did see that you um, are having a town hall tonight and included in that announcement is a link to your statement to the council, which is actually a press release from December. So um, I am hope one of my New Year's resolutions for 2021 is that when you testify that we get your statement before the hearing so that I have the uh, and, and, and council member Mendelson I'd like to respond to that because for some reason my assistant indicates that that my testimony I called him an hour ago to ensure that it was sent to you the person that he forwarded it to he copied me so I'm not sure whether or not we're getting it to the right person but uh, my testimony was submitted okay um, okay and would you also send us, because you said that you had filed an arbitration request, I'm assuming that was something you filed with the PERB? Correct, yes. Could you send us a copy of that so we have the benefit of, uh, under, of seeing specifically the uh, legal arguments you're making for uh, violation of the... Uh, 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 correct, I'll have that forwarded to you today. Great, thank you. Uh, let me turn to my colleagues. Councilmember Gray, do you have any questions? I do, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank all the witnesses <clears throat> for taking the time to come out and testify uh, today. I want to I want to turn to uh, Ebony Rose Thompson, uh, who testified earlier, uh, who of course is uh, the board representative uh, in uh, Ward Seven. Um, Ms. Thompson, I wanted to uh, ask you. I, we, we've gotten some reports about uh, there have been positive cases. Uh, in certain schools, uh, in excuse me, in Ward Seven, uh, for example, um, Kimball, which I believe is where your mother uh, teaches, also uh, Smothers, uh, which is now uh, operating out of uh, Kenilworth uh, School, uh, while the uh, the modernization of the school is taking place, and also Aton, uh, which I visited. Uh, also, I spent some time uh, walking through and talking to the uh, folks who are at uh, A time. So I wonder, um, uh, Ebony, Ebony if, if you have any information related to uh, Kimball, Smothers, and A time. And there's a related question I have for that, and that is um, based on that kind of information, and I know that the continuing advocacy work that you do, um, how much confidence do you have? Uh, in DCPS uh, being able to successfully open uh, for term three. And based on that answer, um, I assume you may have lingering concerns associated with that. And could you articulate for us what those lingering concerns are uh, at this point? Well, um, so I think a couple of things are true. Uh, I, I've seen school communities work really hard um, mm -hmm with what they've been given. I'll say I went on the walkthrough at Kimball 
um, when they, right before, I, I want to say they had already started opening up for care classrooms. Right. Uh, I participated uh, in the reopening core at Woodson and I've, I've seen the plans they've laid out. I, I, I think the honest to God truth is that, and, and which is why I referenced in my testimony that literally it is called a Swiss cheese model. It's not going to be perfect. It's not a question only of if schools are doing their best to keep people safe. I think schools are. I think teachers are. I think principals are. Um, I also know, though, that it's a combination of both what the system can put in place and what individuals are doing. And when we look at the fact that our cases are higher now than when we closed in March, there's a greater, um, there's a greater, there, there's a, there's going to be a greater incidence of cases that creep into school. We can't avoid that. Mm -hmm. um, we also know that people are not perfect. And there's a lot of people who um, will send their kid to school if they have a fever or if they suspect certain things because they need the child care. Um, and so if people aren't perfect, if we're worried that schools don't have everything they need, um, we should be worried um, that everything can't possibly be perfectly safe. Um, so I don't, I don't lay that just at the foot, at the feet of like school communities. I, I think it's kind of inevitable, um, given the spread that we've seen, that there will be some incidences. I, I will say that the last thing I'll say is, um, it's good that we know that that there are cases. I, I'm also concerned just about the level of transparency, um, given charters and childcare uh, facilities mm -hmm. have been open. Um, I don't think we have the same amount of information about the incidence of cases in those school communities. Um, nor do we have a baseline for what the expectation is um, across the education sector, because everybody's not in arbitration with the WTU. Um, so <laughs> I, I, I think we need some more information about school communities generally. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mr. Chairman, do I have any more time? I wanted to ask Fraser O'Leary a question, if I might ask, uh, if I might ask him. You uh, have 53 seconds for, actually 45 seconds for question and answer. Okay. Uh, Mr. O'Leary, you are the uh, you are the uh, state board uh, representative. You have been an outstanding teacher. You have children who are being educated by our schools in the District of Columbia. Um, what is your confidence in DCPS uh, being able to successfully reopen uh, in term three? Uh, I don't have any confidence in that at all. I don't think that I, I don't think it's fair to the students. I don't think it's fair to the parents, and I. Definitely don't think it's fair to the teachers. But well, are you saying we should we should continue in a um, in a uh, in an environment of uh, virtual learning for our children? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. O'Leary. Thank you, Mr. Hoffman. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Gray. Councilmember Tran White. Thank you. Um, I wanted to start off by sending my condolences. Uh, to Mr. Carroll for the loss of his grandmother and all those who've lost or their loved ones because I can sympathize during this time. Uh, I want to start with um, uh, Ms. Davis. Um, I want to know from you, based on your conversations with uh, the union and and DCPS, uh, what, what is DCPS proposing for teachers who opt out of returning uh, to the schools and not teaching? What is the, what is the climate with that? Um, actually, I have not been able to get a straight answer. Um, some of them, some of them were encouraged to apply to be, to apply for sick leave, which makes no sense. These teachers that are they're not sick; they simply want to continue teaching virtually. They have school-aged children at home. They live outside of the district, so we are yet to get clear instructions as to how we're going to accommodate those teachers. And is there a, a recruiting mechanism in place to recruit more teachers? So I heard something about the classroom ratio 11 to 1. Um, that would assume it had to be more classes. Um, and I know I've been to some a lot of schools that had 24, 25 kids. Uh, and it can sometimes over that, which is the um, legal amount. Um, what is happening about trying to recruit people not to replace the teachers we already have because you don't want to do that, but also to cushion the, the burden on the schools? Well, as, I don't know if you're aware, but uh, the school district for the last seven years has recruited over 500 to 700 te new teachers every year. Uh, but we don't want to, uh, you know, to, to contribute to the problem of teacher turnover. And we do have a number of teachers 
who are sort of positioning themselves to leave the system if they are being forced to, um, without options, to return to in-person with no safeguards for their family, for child care, or, or for themselves. So the, the, a, a number of the questions that you're asking, Council Member White, are the very same questions that we have asked in the uh, complaint that we filed with PERB. And so when I send this letter uh, with all of the questions we posed to the chancellor, I will so, copy so, all 13 council members on those questions. So yeah, you, uh, during this time, you haven't had any responses back. I know you had a number of conference calls, uh, meetings uh, with the chancellor. You haven't had any responses back. You gotta have something. We have responses, but they're not, they're not in response to, they're not clear answers on how the school district is going to address the issue of teachers. Uh, who uh, are not able to return for different reasons, health reasons, underlying health conditions, school-aged children, and in some cases, teachers who are simply not comfortable returning at this time based on what's happening in the surging of cases in the district, the fact that the vaccine will not be available to teachers by the time they return. There are so many issues that have not been addressed and questions that have not been answered. And, uh, and, and you to the, that was my next question about uh, the co the coordination between COVID testing and vaccines, and how that how you feel like that was being handled, and if you are uh, if there was some type of strategy you and your team were part of as we go forward, we talk about two weeks. That's a short period of time, right? And the only information I have regarding vaccine distribution or availability for any of the school workers, including teachers, is that, and this was a conversation I had with Chancellor Kirby last Friday is that the vaccine that teachers will be able to go online on the 25th of January to apply to receive the vaccine. Beyond that, I have no further information on how that's gonna work. Thank you. I would like to go to my Ward 8 uh, State Board of Education Rep, Dr. Reed. Dr. Reed, in your testimony, you talked about um, the in-progress findings. Can you repeat what those are and what schools they, they are as well? Yes, one second, I'm doing double duty. Um, so you were asking about the um, findings for in or um, the buildings at the moment. Um, so I reviewed the individual plans that each school has uh, for Ward 8 schools. Um, and just kind of themes were that several schools still have um, the portable uh, HVAC filters. Mm -hmm. um, are still listed as in progress and the um, um, for either water for drinking or access to water to fill up water bottles um, were still outstanding issues. And then when you look at the secondary, because DCPS is looking at um, fully opening, um, I noticed both of our high schools, Blue and Anacostia, um, have um, about half the checklist or a number of items that are still kind of um, floating out there as needing to be remedied before we reopen um, in February 1st, if that's what we're moving towards. Okay, we already um, sure didn't get that information. Mm -hmm. so I thought was, and then specifically, I, I, Henley had underlying uh, electrical and heating issues um, that need to be addressed before adding the extra layer of COVID care. Chairman, can I get 25 more minutes, Chairman? <laughs> uh, you're going to probably get about four more uh, rounds to ask questions with other panel. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, I do want to note the mayor's uh, press conference or situational briefing this morning indicates that next week, 3,900 doses will be a Pfizer will be uh, at Children's Hospital, I believe, for DCPS in-person staff and 1,950 doses to one medical for charter school in-person staff. So that's a total of 5,850 doses presumably available next week for school in-person, according to the mayor's statement this morning. Uh, Councilor McDuffie? Councilor McDuffie? Councilmember Lewis George. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, a few questions. Um, I, I wanted to ask a question to Mrs. Thompson, um, Mother Thompson. <laughs> um, I, I know you spoke uh, earlier about you know you making that really tough decision to actually volunteer yourself on behalf of uh, your your co-teachers, one of which you had childcare. Um, a child care situation and, and your other. And so I want to ask you something. Do you think that if DCPS were to wait until all the that until teachers had the opportunity for vaccines and allowed that to be able to take 
uh, that effect? Do you think more teachers would be willing to go in person uh, if they were able to, to, if there was a wait period for that vaccination? I, I believe that, I believe and I know that more teachers would be willing to go in if they had the proper vaccination. Um, I believe that, I know that more, more families would be willing to send their students to school with teachers that have been vaccinated. Um, and I do know that for a fact. Thank, thank you, Ms. Thompson. I appreciate that. Um, I want to go over to uh, Ward 4's uh, School Board of Education member, Dr. Frazier O'Leary. Um, Dr. O'Leary, we, we've heard uh, from DCPS the importance of opening at the start of term three due to the administrative challenges of adjusting midterm. Uh, given your decades of experience and, and your awareness of the unique challenges of this time, uh, can you share your perspective on this decision? Uh, do you agree that the administrative burden of reopening after this, the start of term three should outweigh the possible benefits of delaying opening to allow more vaccinations and caseload reduction? One thing when I do workshops for teachers is the first thing I talk to them about is if you're gonna be a good teacher, you have to learn how to adjust. And this whole uh, pandemic that started in almost a year ago has uh, caused every one of us to spend our lives adjusting for the last year. And, and if, if, the, if the problem the DCPS has is that they're gonna have problems administratively and having to adjust some schedule yeah. in lieu of the teachers and students and parents' health and well being, then they need to learn how to adjust again, right? None of, the, everybody's doing this. They've never done it before. None of us have ever done it before. Think of nobody, I never even heard of Zoom until I started doing Zooming a year ago. And the thing is, is they can adjust, all right? All we want is for the buildings to be safe, which they're not, and for the children and the teachers and the staff in the buildings to feel safe when they're in those buildings because of vaccines and they're not. Thank you. Um, and in a uh, question, I wanna go to uh, President of uh, the Washington Teachers Union, uh, President Davis. Um, I wanted to talk to you. Have, have any members indicated the, mm -hmm. that they plan to refuse their in-person assignments and are you, what are the consequences for them? Uh, there are some members who are seeking options for if they are going to be required to return for in-person. Um, they basically are seeking um, to leave, resign. Um, and of course, today in a meeting, I heard for the first time um, an option that Chancellor Furby will provide to teachers who um, may not or refuse to return for in-person which is an option that I have never heard of prior to today. Um, it was actually in a discussion that was held with the charter school, the LEAs. Mm -hmm. um, and before I even mentioned that um, option, I, I would need to know more about it. Basically, it would uh, require a teacher to simply resign. So um, not clear on that. One of the things that I am a bit confused about is teachers who are being asked to apply for sick leave, uh, FMLA, uh, who are not sick, but it's the only option they're being given if they, re if they do not want to return for in-person. And if that option is not available to them, then they have no option. Yeah, thank you. And then, and, and then um, one more question. Um, I know the December memorandum of agreement with DCPS at this moment, that MOU is, is still in place. Um, but you've testified earlier that DCPS has withheld data that they have previously agreed to um, share. Uh, so what are, what are the plans of action if DCPS doesn't supply these, this data? And of course, uh, providing the data is only one of the um, non-compliance issues that we are addressing in our complaint. Uh, and I'm, got, I'm not gonna list them on, or cite them on this call, but I will forward you. There were some 15, um, actually 17 non-compliance issues with the MOA. Uh, and of course, this MOA is a supplement to our contract. Both Chancellor Furby and I signed it in agreement. Uh, we all, we both teams made concessions on it, but I think it's a very good document. 
and was a very good guide for how schools should reopen safely. But as I said, if there is no compliance, it's just ink on paper. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Chairman. And I want to thank all the uh, everyone who testified. And I do want to send uh, my condolences um, to you, Mr. Carroll, uh, on your loss. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Lewis George. Uh, Councilmember Silverman, who may not be here because of that funeral. Uh, Councilmember Robert White. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Thank you to uh, to to all uh, on this panel. Um, for uh, let me let me start with uh, State Board uh, Representative uh, Gasoy you know, on outdoor learning. How how, how would outdoor learning work uh, during the uh, dead of winter because outdoor dining, you know, you sit down, you know, maybe 45 minutes, but learning is a lot longer than that. And of course, if you have all walls, you know, in this outdoor space and you're indoors. So can, can you uh, tell me in about a minute, roughly how that that might work and if it's been done somewhere else that is cold? Yes, it has. It is being done um, across the country and climates colder than ours. And it's, it's not new. This is something that you know, some schools were doing before the pandemic, but certainly during the pandemic, there are schools in Maine that are doing it. Um, and uh, I think even closer to home in, in, uh, in uh, Maryland. But what I would say is at this point, we really are looking at term four, which starts in April. Um, and what we are asking for, what, let me talk a little bit about how this would be feasible is really through partnerships with the incredible wealth of outdoor learning partners that we have in DC. And so I don't know if I mentioned this if, or if I had to cut it, but for instance, there's uh, one organization called Foodprints and they are already partnering with 15 DCPS schools, but mostly virtually because of the pandemic. They also had 75% of their funding cut during the pandemic. Um, at this point, that seems counterintuitive to me. They should have their funding reinstituted uh, and then expanded because they are ready to actually do in-person learning with their partner schools this year and then expanding if possible to more schools next year. And this is an organization that can bring teachers in to do the programming for schools. If we know that you know principals are stretched thin um, and if I can interrupt you for a quick second, I, I don't think programming is the primary, is the first concern. It's, um, you know, can we keep the students, you know, uh, safe. safe, yeah. And right. So, so the other thing is that, of course, you know, as I mentioned, the medical community and the science community have shown that being outside itself greatly mitigates the spread of COVID. Then, of course, you you also practice all the safety measures, wearing masks, keeping six feet. We know that that's difficult with children, but there are actually Bria, I think, is going to testify later. Um, and they've been doing this since the beginning of the school year. They winterize, so you can ask them what they've done to, to keep their students outside with pre-K. Um, but there are a lot of details. I, can sh I have pictures I can share with you too, but it's possible and it's actually way more engaging and healthier for students to be outside. Um, right. yeah. let, let me, let me, I hate to interrupt that. I apologize. I have a few other uh, questions. Uh, and this would be for, for all the state board members. Have, have you all heard concerns from uh, students or parents uh, about uh, transportation safety for, for students who would have to take uh, public transportation to school, and is that impacting the ability of certain students to uh, to, to return in-person learning? Uh, I saw uh, uh, Ms. Thompson nod her head, so I'll start with you. The short answer is yes. Uh, we've heard that consistently because so many of our students travel, and I've not seen any, um, I don't know what to call it, remediation COVID plan uh, for Metro. Uh, my mom mentioned my sister travels. That's how she gets to school. She'll be staying virtual. I will say, uh, just to add to Representative Skasoy, um, it's outdoor learning is not an option that we're floating for like every student must do this. It's an opt-in kind of thing. It still would be less numbers of students than the entire school district. Um, and it would require, um, again, funding and winterization. Uh, 
Um, is is Miss Davis still here? I know she had to go to a funeral. Um, I'm I'm still here. I'm checking to see the viewing over the until five o'clock. So thank I you. My, my final question: You mentioned the potential loss of, of teachers as a result of the return plan. Uh, how many teachers are we realistically uh, looking at uh, possibly losing? I mean, is there a real number of teachers, or is this a couple? Um, you know, and I can't give you the number at this time. We surveyed our members last week because we wanted the results of the walkthroughs to see which schools did not meet the safety metrics. And of course, we needed some other information. Um, one of them was to determine how many teachers were opting to leave the system, uh, whether it's by resignation or early retirement. And we have got to compile that information in order to have it uh, prepared. And so we can share that with you at a later time, but I don't have it at hand right now. Thank you. Um, my time is up. Um, thank you, Chair, uh, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Councilmember White. Uh, I'm going to excuse all of you. I want to thank you for taking the time to testify. Uh, I also want to thank the members of the State Board of Education, the five of you who uh, took time to uh, testify. I don't recall a hearing recently where there were so many members from the board. Appreciate that. Uh, and all of the testimony has been helpful. Uh, you, every, sorry to interrupt. I'm not sure if you saw me here. Oh, I did not see you, Councilmember Pinto. Um, five, five minutes, Max. Thank you very much. Um, thank you all for your testimony. And Mr. Carroll, I'm very sorry about the loss of your grandmother as well. I think the fact that you're still here testifying is such a testament to your commitment and how much you care about these issues and getting them right. I want to see if you can elaborate a little bit more. You spoke about uh, feeling comfortable to go back and I'm wondering what types of metrics would provide you that comfort um, that it is a safe environment to go back to. Um, I would look at different metrics around community spread transmission rates and hospitalization rates. And I would also look at the number of individuals who had already been vaccinated. But I also would defer that question to more medical experts as I would consult them before making a full recommendation. But those are some things that jump immediately to mind. Okay. And in DCPS's consultation with medical experts, their metrics that they've shared for their um, assurance that it is safe to reopen are not satisfactory to you. I'm just trying to get a better sense of how we can guide them to use metrics that you would feel comfortable with if the current ones are not. Certainly. Um, if, from, my, from, from my research on the reopening plan, I have yet to see hard metrics that DCPS would rely on to determine when schools might need to be closed or reopen. There is metrics that they're relying on DC data, I believe the phase that DC is in, but I've not yet seen any metrics specifically as they pertain to schools, school opening and school closings. Okay, thank you. Um, and Ms. Davis, you spoke a little bit about the releasing of data um, that Councilmember Lewis George also asked you about. What data is left to be released from DCPS that you would really like to see? Shared. The, 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 the main thing that is driving the reopening plans at each individual school is family demand. We have yet been able to get family demand for any school. What we have gotten is from our teachers who are reporting that in some cases family event demand is very low. Um, we're very concerned about some of the inequities that are going to exist as a result of in-person teaching where students who come from Ward 7 and 8 schools to ride the metro to Hardy Middle School or Wilson High School, their parents are not trusting putting their kids on public transportation given what's happening with COVID. So in, in those instances, the students who are supposedly the focus, the ones who've had the greatest amount of academic drop off are really not the ones returning for in-person. So that's just one of the issues. Family demand is really supposed to be driving the reopening plans, yet we are not able to get any information on how many families have opted to have their student kids return for in-person in any school. Okay, thank you. Um, and perhaps to uh, Ms. Gasoy and Mr. Carroll, can you talk a little bit about the communication lags that are happening now between DCPS and teachers and how those specifically can be improved? What mediums should be utilized and frequency of those uh, information sharing tactics? Or with families or with teachers? 
did you say? With teachers. So I'm glad you asked that because part of my longer testimony that I cut is that, you know, I don't know if many people are aware that actually uh, back in August and September, Fer uh, Chancellor Farabee did gather principals. He invited them to come to what he called huddles, professional huddles, and they shared ideas. And then uh, DCPS invited uh, school leaders to submit plans based on sort of capacity interest of their school communities. And that's why we have some um, small scale uh, initiatives that are school-based that are sustainable. Um, but then the, the term three plan threatened to, um, to kill those basically. And, and since they were rolled back, that they've continued. Um, and that's something that not many folks know. I just know that from speaking with principals in my ward. And I'm bringing that up because I think that's the way to do it is to work collaboratively, to invite the professionals, the ones who are tasked with carrying out the reopening to have conversations with each other and with system leaders and to come up with plans together. And that's how everybody becomes sort of, or you get buy-in from everybody and you make the plan sustainable. I'll add quickly, um, if thinking specifically about reopening, I saw over the summer, the mayor had crafted a reopen core focus on school and President Davis and the WTU had to advocate to get teachers and principals on that committee. So from the outset, I don't believe that DCPS has been genuine and their uh, want to communicate and receive feedback and input. Um, if, as an individual teacher, I don't really receive anything but decisions that have been made and I would defer potentially to Ms. Davis if there's any time to elaborate on communication. Thank you very much. I'm out of time, but thank you all for that constructive feedback. Thank you, Councilor. Sure. So I was on the brink of excusing all of you, thanking you for your testimony. Several of you did not give us uh, statements. If you would please do that. That's actually most helpful to us if we get the statements before the hearing, but uh, the record will be open for a couple of weeks. And thank you all. I'm going to call the next um, 18 witnesses. And I'm also going to ask that my colleagues uh, for the next two rounds of witnesses that we uh, try to scale back our questions. I'll try to scale back mine. I'm hopeful that we get to the chance around four o'clock and we still have 36 witnesses. So let me call in the next group. Matthew Hansen, who's Chief of Staff at DC Action for Children. Natano. Chizda Majid, who's a teacher at DCPS. Grace Hu, who's with Digital Equity in DC Education. Martin Wells, who's president of the Ward 2 Education Council. Scott Goldstein, who's executive director of Empower Ed. Laura Gerendinger, who is uh, with the DC Coalition on Equitable Outdoor Education. Allison Kreiner Brown, who's with Beers Elementary School, LSAT slash reopening committee. Langston Tingling Clemens, who's at Jefferson Academy Middle School. Alexandra Simbana, Kathy Gergel, Lauren Kunis, who's a parent at Langley Elementary School. Sasha Silverman, who's an outdoor teacher. Emily Grief, who is a DCPS parent and teacher, and I guess lives in Ward 6. Elham Debrazorgi, Svetlana Viturina, who is listed as a parent at DCPS. Monique Sullivan, who's a DCPS teacher. Salim Adolfo, who's uh, the DC chapter of the National Black United Front. And James Tenderek, who is listed as a public witness. We pause for a moment. I think we're still letting folks in, but we'll start with Mr. Hansen. Uh, witnesses should be in gallery view, meaning that you can see the clock. And uh, the clock for a moment deceptively said five minutes. Actually, witnesses have three minutes. Uh, please be mindful of the time. Uh, Mr. Hansen, and uh, it's good to see you. Um, good afternoon, uh, Chairman Mendelson and members of the community of the whole. Thank you for the opportunity to testify at today's public roundtable on reopening the district's public schools. My name is Matthew Hansen, and I am the Chief of Staff at DC Action for Children. 
on behalf of the organization, I appreciate the opportunity to add our voice to this important conversation. With over 34,612 cases and 864 deaths to date, the impact of the pandemic, uh, the impact that the pandemic has had on the district has been tragic. And we know that black and brown and low income residents have been hit the hardest, exacerbating just about every social inequity, including in education. Even with the arrival of vaccines, we know that we need to plan for a long road ahead and we should be doing everything in our power to keep people safe and healthy and support students, families, and teachers during this period. The mayor recently announced that teachers would become eligible for vaccination beginning next week and with at least two weeks needed between doses and time after that for the vaccine to take full effect, we believe that the district should do the reasonable and safe thing by pushing back the start of limited in-person learning until that time. Return to in-person learning should not resume until educators have had an opportunity to, be, to get fully vaccinated. We know that the district does not, yet, uh, does not yet have enough vaccines to vaccinate all frontline workers. And until more doses are available, we should not push teachers or other essential workers to return to work in person. To the best support educators, children, youth, and working families, we encourage the district to consider some of the following recommendations as part of a reopening plan moving forward. Um, it's incredibly important that we offer to vaccinate all educators. The district must include early childhood educators on the list of those who become eligible for the vaccine beginning January 25th. These workers care for and educate our youngest residents and many teachers in our public schools will depend on them for their own childcare when they begin to resume in-person teaching. Providers across the district have kept their doors open throughout the pandemic, serving families who need access to care. It's an insult to these essential workers and educators to exclude them from the next round of people who will become eligible for vaccination after all, all they have done these past months. My written testimony includes additional recommendations, but just to highlight one of my final few moments, I would like to emphasize the need to draw on all of our existing resources, including out of school time programs to help support students during virtual learning and throughout the pandemic and its aftermath. These programs have been essential in connecting families with resources, providing community, and offering social emotional support. We must promote increased coordination and communication with out of school time partners and ensure that they are part of the planning process for reopening, such as inviting key programs to be part of the reopen community core and ensuring they are part of the planning process for summer learning and preparation for the next school year. While we do not, uh, while we do not have a fuller clear picture yet about the increase in education outcome disparities, we know that we will need to leverage all of our existing resources to close this widening gap. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Mr. Hansen. And I don't believe we have a copy of your statement, if you would send that. Ms. Majid? Not here. I'm told is not here. Uh, Grace Hu? Hi, my name is Grace Hu. I'm a DCPS parent and one of the co-leads for Digital Equity in DC Education Parent Coalition. Today, I'm here to provide an update on where we are as we move into term three and start preparing for the upcoming 22 budget process and next school year. On devices and hardware, the main point is progress has been made, but more work is needed. DCPS has distributed more than 35,000 computers to students, but has not guaranteed reliable computers for every, every teacher to do distance learning. Some schools were able to get old computers donated for teachers. One of the DCPS instructional models for term three involves simulcasting lessons in which a teacher instructs students in class and online at the same time with the help of webcams, microphones, and other equipment. DCPS Central is not guaranteeing this equipment for all schools. In some cases, PTAs and outside groups are starting to purchase this equipment, which is inequitable for schools that cannot access external funding. We do not yet have a comprehensive multi-year plan in place to ensure regular refresh of technology or tech supports. We will not achieve long-term digital equity until we can get past one-off ad hoc tech purchases. On broadband internet, attention is needed um, on to speed and quality, not simply if internet access is, exists. While some schools have received infrastructure upgrades to improve internet connectivity and reliability, others have not. On home internet for online learning, the key question is, do you have the internet bandwidth and speed to allow a student to live stream instruction and watch videos while multiple people in the household are online at the same time? In a survey we conducted, over 30% said they experienced slowdowns or disconnections while doing online learning. Almost 15% said their personal data plan or home internet plan was not sufficient. 
So where do we go from here? We urge you to press DCPS and Octo on their plans for providing tech supports, including asking questions such as, what is your plan for ensuring adequate tech equipment for the reopening of schools, including equipment for simultaneous instruction? What is your timeline for purchasing student and teacher computers so that we will be ready for next school year? And how will DC government work towards a long-term internet solution to ensure residents in all wards have high quality home broadband internet besides the low, um, beyond the basic low bandwidth programs offered by companies like, like Comcast? Lastly, please see the appendix of the letter for the letter we sent the mayor on our technology priorities in which we discuss issues that I could not cover in this three minute testimony. And I apologize, I have to get back to work so I will not be here for, to answer questions, uh, but our email address is on the testimony and we're happy to talk offline if you'd like to discuss more. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Ms. Hu. And we do have a copy of your statement that's helpful. Uh, Martin Wells. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman Mendelson, members of council. I'll dispense with my background as, as most folks know it, except for uh, Ms. Lewis George. I realize you're new to the council. Welcome and congratulations. I am happy to see that DCPS is implementing a phase reopening with a virtual option. Um, our children are suffering from isolation, declines in learning, declines in physical fitness and nutritional degradation. I respect each family's right to make their own choice for sending their children to school or keeping them home and learning virtually. No one wants harm to come to any family, but I am concerned about mental and physical health impact of homebound children. My teenagers are sorely in need of in-class instruction. They no longer have an athlete's level of physical fitness as their sports teams have all been dormant. One of my children has been accepted into an in-person class for one day per week and another has been offered a slot but not yet received confirmation. I intend to allow my children to attend and will provide them with hand sanitizer, mask, gloves. It's a choice families should have. They will be riding the bus, the Metro. Uh, we live in Ward 6 and their school is in Ward 3. Uh, you know, when we talk about educational equity, we need to look at not just our own microcosm in the District of Columbia, but we also need to compare ourselves with other um, entities throughout the United States. Um, I have anecdotal evidence that Florida is open for in-person learning and New York City also has in-person le uh, um, learning. My sibling is a, a public high school teacher in a Milwaukee suburb in a large high school. She, um, they, their school never closed down. She has been teaching four days per week uh, in, in person and had uh, one day per week virtual. Um, she said that there had been 14 cases of COVID among staff students, but no deaths. Um, obviously 14 is 14 too many, but um, they couldn't pin the outbreak or they couldn't pin those cases just to the school. Now, juxtapose that with the urban environment, the proper city of Milwaukee, which has not had any in-person learning, it's virtual, uh, largely low income, um, students attend that school. I've heard that, uh, I'm gonna skip a little bit here, but we need a benchmark that we can follow, not a date. Um, so is the benchmark 3% transmission rate? Is it 2%? Is it 1%? Is it decrease in hospitalizations? Is it 5% of the population being vaccinated? Is it 20% of the population being vaccinated? We need some empirical data. And then we have to, um, rely on that and depend on it. Um, my time is coming to a quick end. So I just wanna say that I believe every family should have a choice on whether to attend in-person learning, but that in-person learning needs to be an option for parents who choose it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wells. And I have a copy of your statement. Thank you. Scott Goldstein. Good afternoon. Back in April, Empower Ed teacher leaders laid out a plan to respond to the pandemic and assure an equitable recovery. We built on that plan in July and laid out a clear roadmap of reopening and recovery. Since then, instead of heeding teacher proposed solutions, we've spent months mired in a debate about indoor in-person reopening, even as data shows that most parents, especially east of the river, aren't asking for that. I want to go back to the core tenets of the plan we laid out to demonstrate how we could have and still can take a different approach that would ensure a less contentious and far more productive path to a safe, joyful, 
learning for students and fam relief for families. The proposal included first, providing outdoor learning opportunities for all who want them, especially elementary school students where in-person learning is so critical and screen time so detrimental to growth. Second, focusing on improving virtual learning, especially for middle and high school students where it's working better. Uh, we haven't spent nearly enough time sharing lessons that work in that regard. Third, providing direct payments monthly to low-income families per child until the end of the emergency for child care and education support. This model has proved successful in New Jersey and elsewhere. Fourth, invest in digital equity following the recommendations of the Digital Equity in DC Coalition. I'm happy to answer questions about any of these steps, which taken together would have put us in a stable place and brought so much comfort and security to families while continuing learning. But I'll focus more today on outdoor learning. The science is clear. COVID-19 transmission drops dramatically when outdoors. Outdoor dining has been about the only lifeline for our struggling restaurant industry. That's why Mayor Bowser set up a $4 million fund to help our restaurants winterize for outdoor dining to keep them afloat. But what about our kids? Dr. Fauci has recommended education be moved primarily outdoors since the beginning of the pandemic. And it's in fact exactly the way the US survived educationally in previous pandemics, even in cold months. Now, as we approach spring and summer, it's clear the most viable path back to normal. That's why we've asked, along with a unanimous resolution from the state board, for the mayor to invest $4 million in a fund for outdoor education for any school that wants to employ it. Voluntary for teachers, voluntary for families, but a safer and more joyful option for all. The organizations and infrastructure are there to scale this up incredibly fast. We just need the investment. Notably, our pilot of outdoor learning in Ward 8 has seen tremendous in interest. At the same time, Ward 8 parents have expressed strong opposition to sending their children back indoors. We need council members to call on the mayor to make this investment. Finally, now that we're so close to a vaccine, it makes no sense to force teachers back just weeks before they can get vaccinated. It will take time to get done, to achieve immunity. And when asked about vaccinations for childcare workers, a representative from DC Health said they were not prioritizing them because they were focused on educators, in quotes. Child care workers are educators and have been in, per, uh, in person for many months. We have to prioritize our child care workers as well. If we use outdoor learning to bridge the time gap during the coming months and focus on a full reopening for K-12 once vaccinations are complete, we can avoid the fits and starts that have plagued this year and truly serve all families. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Goldstein. And I have a copy of your statement. Uh, Laura Darren Dinger. Thank you. My name is Laura Darendinger. I am a public health nurse, and it's an honor for me to be here to speak to you about outdoor education as a science-informed tool for both this emergency pandemic response as well as for the long term. When we are in a pandemic with new viral strains, it's even more important than ever to follow what science tells us. The science says to combine physical, dis physical distancing, mask wearing, and that when we gather with people outside our immediate bubble, it's best to do so in the outdoors, outside of buildings where the virus transmission is significantly diminished. As policymakers, science needs to inform what you fund for getting children back to school. Following science, we should prioritize Ward 8, Ward 7, and other communities most affected by the virus. In public health, we employ scarce resources where they will have the greatest impact. Outdoor learning is a tool you can use. Peer-reviewed independent academic research, not funded by private industry, supports using the tool of outdoor learning. The current model, which heavily relies on computers, does not have strong science to back it, as a publicly funded tool. Independent peer reviewed research informs this statement as well. Examples and links to this research are available at the end of my testimony. The logistics of implementing outdoor learning is demonstrated as viable and able to be scaled up for the benefit of more children if it is funded here in Washington DC with a minimum of $4 million for a, for a robust start for schools, teachers and families who would like to opt in to this choice. Several successful pilots across this city have been ongoing since September and into and through the winter. Today, as I speak, there are outdoor classrooms happening. 
um, even though it is cold outside. Transportation solutions to mitigate virus exposure do exist in the framework of outdoor learning as well. Using outdoor spaces demonstrates an effective way to balance the transition back to in-person learning. Other public school districts across the country have already financed and, out and implemented outdoor learning options. From my perspective, it's morally wrong to withhold an intervention that we know works, is informed by science, and it will help our most vulnerable, vulnerable children and families. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Darren Dinger. Uh, and I don't believe we have a copy of your statement, so if you could provide that. Allison Kreiner Brown. Good afternoon. Are you all able to hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm on my phone. I'm trying to get to the view so I can see the timer. Um, all right, we'll just do the best that we can. Okay. Uh, good evening uh, to the council member, or good afternoon to the council members um, and to all. Thank you for the op opportunity to testify. So I'm going to be very honest because the world has been on fire. Um, there thankfully should be brighter days ahead, but between balancing and juggling children, work, uh, my own health and well being, all I have is some napkin sketches. So let's go with what we've got here. Okay, a few things. One, uh, yes, I'm Allison Kreiner Brown. Um, I live in Ward 8. I'm a parent of a first grader at Beers and also have a two and a half year old. So we're running daycare and first grade for distance learning here. Um, the health metrics, just as a parent, it's, it's a huge concern that the numbers and continue to go up. And it's not just about, you know, if kids go back to school, you know, they might get sick. Um, you know, we're certainly concerned about the adults getting sick. I don't want to have to explain to my daughter why her, a teacher or a staff member, you know, died or can no longer come back to the school, but also the transmission between families um, and between communities is still a huge concern. The teachers should not have to go back until they're vaccinated. Um, one of the reasons why I sort of at least push back on some or stop pushing back on the cares, and I know there are some school communities who are doing uh, learning already, in-person learning, um, it just, it really still needs to be based on volu uh, voluntary um, participation, particularly on the teachers and staff side. Um, so that's still a big concern, again, especially with the vaccine in sight. Um, and with, you know, potentially a few months, we could have a, a greater number of teachers uh, vaccinated. The reopening committee was a very challenging and heartbreaking experience. I am very happy to answer questions about that. We were not pleased with the plan that was given back to us. Um, we do, and I'll speak particularly for the parents who were on the committee with me, um, prioritizing students um, is not the same thing as an equitable plan. We kept trying to figure out how can we build a plan around our families that have the greatest need, and that was not in the model A, B, C, D option. To the council members particularly, direct support is needed to families. Um, rent relief, I mean, there are so many different kinds of school supplies that we've had to get to support our kids this year, kitchen timers, just there's a lot of support that families are um, need that the council needs to do beyond just looking at in-person learning. A lot of families will continue to need distance learning, even our highest, um, our learners with highest needs because of health concerns as have been stated before. Um, so the council really needs to figure out how to support families where they are and in-person learning should not be seen as the only quote equitable option. With all that I have said, I am interested in outdoor learning. And I was with Ms. Stamper um, and Ms. Darren Dinger um, at an event at Oxenlund Park. We want to see more creativity, um, not only from DCPS, but from the city in utilizing our resources to support families. Um, please follow the recommendations of the Digital Equity Coalition. Other concerns that come up for me as a parent when kids uh, and families, when kids do go back to in-person learning, substitutes the disruptions that will come from having to close schools, um, there just are still a lot of concerns all around. I'm not sending my child anytime soon, and I'll stop there. Thank you. And if you could provide us with a copy of your statement, that would be helpful. Langston King Kingman Clemens. I'm told that he's not here. Alexandra Simbana. 
Good afternoon. Good afternoon, um, Mr. Chairman and the council members. Thank you for allowing me time to speak today. Um, I'm a DCPS parent and um, I'm part of the digital equity team as well. Um, so let's talk about DC. Well, it's been exactly 365 days since the first COVID case was recorded in the US. On March 12th, 2020, before any formal action, we pulled our child out of school due to the worldwide news reports of COVID spreading quickly. Some thought we were overreacting when we spoke out against returning to school in August, we were told we were ill-informed and reactionary. But parents were ahead of the curve then, just as we are now, because we are careful about our kids. When we say that we aren't comfortable returning to in-person classes, it's because we want to be careful, not only about the health and well-being of our own kids, but their classmates, their teachers, and all the families in our school communities. We're all tired. We're, we all wish we could get back to our old lives but now is not the time. Vaccines are not readily available. The pandemic is raging out of control still. We closed schools in March at a time when only 17 cases had been reported in the district. Why are we talking about reopening when we are almost reporting 2000 cases a week? It is like taking the boards off the windows just as a hurricane is making landfall. It makes no sense. We're holding this hearing by Zoom because it's not safe to do in person. Why would we force our teachers into a setting where they won't be safe? With President Biden, we will finally have the competent, compassionate leadership that we need to fight this pandemic, but the virus won't just go away overnight. There is light at the end of the tunnel, but we are still very much in the middle of that tunnel. So what can we do? We can invest in long-term solutions like one-to-one -one devices for students and teachers. We can invest in the infrastructure to bring robust, reliable, and affordable Wi-Fi options to every home, every school, in the city, in every neighborhood, and every ward. If it's not safe to learn at school, let's make it easier to learn at home. The investments we make in technology, devices, and internet access will pay dividends long after the pandemic is over. Access to technology will play a critical role in 21st century learning and in our economy. At a time when so many things seem to be beyond our control, let's do one thing that we can control. We can do this. We can meet this challenge now. Let's make 21st century learning work for everybody. I would also like to add that just this morning, CDC Director Walensky said they are starting an audit to identify where the supply breakdowns are and how to correct them. This new administration needs time to untangle the true status of where we are and what was left behind of the national inventory and to deploy the Defense Protection Act to this to address the shortages. Any return to school right now is premature. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Simbana. And we have a copy of your statement. Thank you. Kathy Krugall. Hi, thank you. And thank you for the opportunity today. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Um, I'm a DC resident and mother of a DCPS child. Um, I agree with those who have expressed the urgency of opening DC schools, and I am just at a loss as to why schools continue to be closed for 10 months with virtually no information about plans for widespread reopening, preparation for widespread reopening, support from the city to DCPS on reopening, or how decisions are even made to reopen or remain closed. When other school systems in many parts of the country are open, why isn't the same thing happening here in DC, and why do, why do we not have the choice to send children back to school in person? There are so many reports from around the country about the low transmission of COVID within schools that showing that we do not need to wait for a vaccination. We just don't need to wait for one. It's too long, too much time has passed already. My child is five years old in kindergarten, receives about two and a half hours of instruction per day online. And anyone who watches a five-year-old for each for just one day try to go to school online will realize this is not working. It has no hope of working. And it's unconscionable that the DCPS and the city has allowed this to go on for so long. The school year has been a year of, of no education and even worse than that, experiencing extreme isolation in these children. My child and kids like him need to be back in school and we do not have the option to go back to school. Every family should have the option to go back to school in person if they want that choice. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gergal. And it would help if we had a copy of your statement. Uh, I don't. Uh, Lauren Tunis. Hi, thank you. 
I'm here today as a Ward 5 DCPS parent to share my hope that we find a way to move forward with the reopening of schools for families who need it most and for those who choose. I'm also asking you to do everything in your power to improve transparency and communication to families across the board and in every school around reopening issues. Lastly, I wanna echo the requests that have already been made around scaling up outdoor learning beginning in term four and for planning to start now for the long-term programming and appropriate resources to help our students make up for the learning loss and social emotional challenges that this past year has caused. My daughter has been a student at our neighborhood DCPS school in Ward 5 for three years. It's a Title I school serving over 300 students, primarily from Ward 5, but also with six self-contained classrooms educating special needs students from across the district. 50% of our students are considered at risk, 30% have disabilities, 7% are English language learners, and 7% are experiencing homelessness. Remote learning is particularly challenging for many students at our school and similar students across the district. This is a council in a city that values equity. As many of you know, private schools and daycares have been open in person for months, operating largely without incident. And so in our city right now, your child only has access to guaranteed in-person and developmentally appropriate education if your family has the means to pay for it. This is a council and a city that values and trusts science. Data shows that with proper safety precautions like the ones we are trusting DCPS to put in place, schools are not major drivers of the spread of COVID-19. Speaking solely as a parent, the plans that always seem to be communicated to us and then fall through at the last minute have deeply damaged our trust in DCPS. DCPS has devolved much decision-making to individual schools, but at the same time, I believe it needs to mandate clear and comprehensive communication at the individual school level on an appropriate timeline so that all families receive the information they need to decide what's right for them and build confidence and trust in the plan. At our school, families were called with offers of in-person instruction starting about 10, day 10 days ago, but it wasn't until yesterday that information was distributed to the broader school community about the specific plans and the health and safety metrics put in place. Tomorrow will be the first time that the broader school community is able to provide feedback on the specific plan that will be implemented at our school in less than two weeks. Last but certainly not least, I also ask DCPS and the council to work alongside our teachers and school administrators to develop and appropriately fund the programs needed in the spring, summer and beyond to help our school communities come back stronger. Thank you for your dedication to this issue and for taking the time to hear from us all. Ms. Kunis, thank you for your testimony. Uh, I don't believe we have a copy of your statement though. Sorry, I'll send. Thank you. Sasha Silverman? Uh, no. I'm told she's not here. Emily Grief? Hello, Chairman Mendelson and members of the council. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Emily Greif. I am a resident of Ward 6 and a teacher at School Within School at Goding, where I'm also a parent to a fourth grader at the school. I'm before you today to uh, to voice opposition of reopening our schools until all staff are provided access to a vaccination protocol that the CDC has approved. I also call on everyone to critically examine the lack of equity in school reopening planning. Specifically, efforts to date have focused solely on reopening school buildings rather than seeking to strengthen virtual instruction for those that are not clamoring for an in-person seat. In many cases, those are the students that most critically need it. Educational equity means that each child receives what they need to develop their full social and academic potential. DCPS purports to have committed prioritizing in-person learning seats for students furthest from opportunity, yet these students are not the primary ones who will benefit from in-person learning. In data procured and supplied by DCPS, over half of families in wards five, seven, and eight preferred a virtual only option. In ward seven, that percentage was 70%. For these and many other DCPS families, an offered in-person seat is not the golden ticket, as many more affluent DC residents have regarded it, but a risk that cannot be taken during this pandemic that has so adversely affected Black and Brown communities. No one disagrees with the fact that the best place for children to learn and grow socially and academically is inside school buildings with caring, dedicated educators. 
The most recent DCPS Parent Town Hall on January 13th committed more than half of a 30 minute presentation exalting the district's investments in HVAC improvements. In my opinion, it goes without saying that instituting the highest health and safety measures in school buildings should be a top priority even in non-pandemic times. Rather than consulting, listening to, and respecting the voices of those who expressed a preference to continue virtual learning due to concerns that can't be assuaged by basic building improvements, efforts have focused solely on resuming in-person learning. By not working to strengthen the virtual learning experience for these students and the educators who care so deeply for them, DCPS risks further marginalizing those who bear a disproportionate burden and risk. The vaccines are within reach and hopefully an end to this pandemic as well. I urge everyone, elected officials, educators, fellow citizens, all to better acknowledge the risks, doubts, fears, and voices of those often unheard in our community and also seek to improve and create systems to meet their needs. Use this dark period that has highlighted and exacerbated inequalities to affect real and lasting change. To quote Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., whose memory we honored this week, there is no deficit in human resources, the deficit is in human will. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and for doing all in your power and will to seek equity in DCPS reopening measures and beyond. Thank you, Ms. Greif. And I apologize for mispronouncing your name at the beginning and we have a copy of your statement, thank you. Uh, Elham Debrazogi. Is Ms. Debazorgi Deber, here, please? I'm gonna keep... Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Somebody. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Elham Debazorgi. I'm a parent to three young girls. Two of them attend Hearst Elementary, a first grader and a third grader. I'm here to advocate for schools to reopen more fully and safely to everyone who prefers the in-person option for term four, which starts in mid-April. Yes, there are many families who want safe and in-person learning, though they may not always be the loudest voice in the room. First, before I talk about reopening more broadly, I do wanna mention that the most urgent need right now is to immediately find a way to bring back students with special needs. To go a full year without in-person learning for these kids is extremely harmful. My children luckily do not have special needs, but I feel the need to advocate for the many families who are watching their children struggle and regress due to the special needs not being met. Why is this not sending off alarms for everyone? Our school recently announced that they would not be bringing back any CES students due to staffing limitations. That's shocking and it's unacceptable. A neighbor's autistic child spends five hours of his day swinging back and forth on a playset as a coping mechanism for not being in school. It breaks my heart to see that and parents are at a loss. They need to work and they don't have the special skills necessary for teaching an autistic child. Staffing limitations cannot be an impediment to accomplish this and we need to find the staff and get all special needs students in school now. But second, we very much wanna send our kids to in-person school and we know many parents who would choose the same for their children. Distance learning was a good short-term fix, but it's not effective with many kids, and it certainly is not a long-term solution. DCPS is reopening for term three next week, and there are many families who did not get invited back. I'm advocating for schools to more fully open in term four, which starts in mid-April, such that any family who wants the in-person option can send their kids to school. We need to start from somewhere. I've watched our school reconfigure its HVAC, bring on three health technicians, require student COVID testing, make PPP, PPE available, restrict the outdoor playground to keep their in-person students safe. Despite meeting all the safety requirements that were demanded by the WTU, we still see staff refusing to come in. With teachers eligible for the vaccine soon, I hope DCPS will require those who can teach in person to come into the school buildings. Many of us are working in person, Many people in society have been carrying the load for society since March. Our healthcare workers have taken on the biggest burden of all and they continue their important work. 
And despite the risks, our grocery store workers, trash collection, mail delivery, retail workers, they're all working in person. And we need them to continue their work. And my hope is that the teachers, soon vaccinated, will also do their job in person, safely and effectively. None of us want to get sick, and none of us want our teachers or our children to get sick. But there are countless countries, private schools, and other school districts far larger than ours have found a way to continue in-person learning safely. And so we know it's possible and we can do it and we just need DCPS to be innovative and creative and offer new solutions. This virus is not going away anytime soon and we need to learn to navigate it safely. Families who choose distance learning should be able to continue, but the many families who want in-person learning should also be able to send their children to school. Thank you council members for this opportunity and thank you for everyone in DCPS for working so hard in this challenging time. Uh, thank you, Ms. Zardi, and it's nice to see you. Uh, I don't believe we have a copy of your statement though, if you could provide that. I'll send it along, nice to see you too. Thank you. Uh, Svetlana Viturina. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to associate myself with statements by Mr. Wells. Uh, and Mrs. Um, Kunis uh, Gurgal and the last speaker, please. Um, I will be brief. Um, I am uh, a strong advocate of uh, school reopening. Um, I think like other speakers, uh, people have a choice and we have spoken uh, at, at least five surveys that we have filled in. And uh, DL is not working, especially for elementary school children. Let's not kid ourselves. I have a second grader and a sixth grader. I see a huge difference in how they can take care of themselves or not. Um, I am very upset about knee jerk reactions and opening, which are uh, very harmful to families and kids. I am a bit shocked ab about the discussion going on right now in this meeting when there is an announcement and an agreement about opening in term three I have a class list. My child has accepted a seat. He's very excited. And uh, I am not sure if how will I communicate to him that potentially we may not open again. This is unsustainable. Um, I would like to touch upon a little bit of a high school and middle school. I think we're leaving kids behind like you would not believe. My child in the sixth grade is learning one third of a program that is usually taught in school. This is scary. I don't know what to do about it because there is no books that they study on. I am getting tutors because I can afford tutors, but I am just, uh, per I, mean, I am amazed how this is uh, um, allowed to be and why we're not taking Wednesdays and why nothing is happening, no teaching is happening on Wednesdays. So if talking about inequality, I will be able to pay for my kids' school, private school if needed, tutors as needed, but majority of families in this, in this city will not. So distance learning not working. There is a, a big opposition to in-person learning when there is a lot of already um, communication and things done and the goalposts are constantly moving. So now the goalpost is vaccination, but who can tell us that teachers will be willingly vaccinated because it's also a choice. So to conclude this, when do we know what the metric will be? And I think Mr. Wells referred to it really well. What is gonna be the metric? All teachers vaccinated, again, no COVID cases in DC. This is unsustainable. And I'm sorry, but I'm not seeing anything from leaders on either side of how we're gonna be addressing this. This year is pretty much gone. But I am now very concerned about next year. So if somebody can answer me this, it would be great. I'm following over discussion. There's really little communication. Parents are not involved. So it is extremely frustrating. Um, sorry for this emotional uh, testimony, but this is how I think many, many people feel. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ms. Fitzgerald. And your testimony is fine, um, in fact, Sometimes emotion, speaking from the heart is good. We don't have a copy of your statement though, so I appreciate that. And if you stick around, uh, we will be uh, asking questions of the chancellor. Thank you very much. Uh, Monique Sullivan, who's a DCPS teacher. 
Salim Adolfo. Is, is Salim Adolfo here? Uh, James Tenderic. Hi, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is James Tanderic, and I am an ESL teacher at Center C Public Charter Schools, and I am the Ward 4 Fellow for Empower Ed. I'm here to testify for the delay of schools reopening in DCPS until all teachers and staff are vaccinated, and there's a, there's a substantial decrease in the spread of COVID in DC. At my school, we've been, we've been largely virtual since the beginning of, of the pandemic. As someone who has a chronic health condition, even thinking about my school and going back to in person is not only scary, but disrespectful to many of, of our teachers. I have seen the articles highlighting the need for reopening of schools because of the decreased academic and social emotional skills of students. This is happening at my school. I worry about my students' reading levels as well as their emotions due to all the screen time that we're having. I've also heard from many DCPS teachers from the State Board of Education meetings expressing their concerns for reopening and even some questioning whether they want to stay in teaching. We are amid multiple crises in our country and adding on reopening schools when it is not safe to do so could lead to a huge increase of teacher turnover and a lack of trust from DC teachers. Now we all know the rules of the vaccine. The vaccine requires two doses, which need to be three weeks apart. It also requires one to two weeks after the second shot to ensure you have the maximum protection from COVID-19. I know that's starting next week. These teachers who are going back for in-person teaching will be able to apply for the vaccine and get it. If you just get the vaccine next week, that means they'll not be fully vaccinated until the third week of February. Schools will plan to reopen on February 1st, which means teachers will not be fully vaccinated when schools reopen. Teachers need to be fully vaccinated so they are protected by the virus, as well as assure as our black and brown teachers that the vaccine is worth taking. Only by doing that, schools can even begin to talk about reopening. Um, also, as we all know, many of our indicators for COVID-19 are placed in our yellow or red category. We have seen a nationwide surge of cases and deaths from people traveling for the holidays, and DC is no exception. It is simply too dangerous for schools to reopen right now. We need to wait until the surge ends later this month to even consider reopening. We are also in the winter season, which we have seen has brought an increase of cases and deaths. A solution for this is to wait until the fourth quarter to reopen schools. Hopefully with the warmer weather, all teachers are vaccinated and a push for outdoor learning by DCPS it provides several place guards for teachers to feel safe going back to work. Teachers are incredible. We are empathetic, hardworking, and want nothing more than to go back to school. I cannot wait until I see my kids in person and be able to talk, laugh, and teach face to face. But with no plans for fully vaccinating teachers, as well as a surge of cases and deaths, it is simply not the time to reopen. The latest reopening plan until fourth quarter, work with teachers on reopening to see if it is good for us, and hopefully teachers and kids can be together again by the end of this school year. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Tenderick. Uh, I do not have any questions. I'll turn to colleagues. Uh, I was hoping that we would get to the chancellor at four o'clock, which is a half hour from now, and we have 18 more witnesses after this. Uh, so I would ask that members forego questions unless there's something uh, critical that, that they, um, they need to find out. Councilmember Gray, do you have any questions? You're on mute. Can you hear me, Mr. Chairman? Yes, I can. Okay, well, I, I do have a number of questions, but I will forego at your request, I will forego those questions so we can get to the uh, chancer. But um, there, there are lots of questions that have evolved from the testimony uh, that we have had uh, you know, they range anywhere from people who think we should go back immediately to those who think we shouldn't go at all uh, until the fourth quarter, to like the last uh, witness uh, who testified. Um, but I'll, I'll wait until after, uh, uh, until we get to the chair, the, uh, the chancellor uh, to ask my questions. Thank you, Councilmember. Councilmember Treon White. Councilmember Kenyon McDuffie. Councilmember uh, Lewis George. Yes, uh, yes, Chairman. I have one question. I'm gonna I'm gonna give it to. Although I know multiple people spoke on this, I'm gonna give it to Scott Goldstein from Empower Ed. Um, and I'm asking this question so it can inform my questions to the Chancellor uh, regarding uh, DCPS. Um, Scott, I know you spoke to uh, having a plan. Um, you're developing a plan. 
uh, for outdoor learning. What have you heard uh, from DCPS regarding uh, their, you know, uh, unwillingness to uh, look at outdoor learning? And can you say uh, more just about, you know, what we can do to make outdoor learning happen uh, if we were to open in, in the in the in term four? Um, I just want to get some feedback on what you've been receiving from the Chancellor DCPS as why they are refusing to do this. So I can ask those questions directly to the Chancellor. Sure, so we've uh, had talked to the, both the Chancellor and the Deputy Mayor about outdoor learning since the summer in several meetings, and uh, they have always expressed support for the idea in concept, in theory, um, and have stated that it is in their guidance to tell people that it is safer to be outdoors. But none of there has been no systemic support to do it, right? No funding to do it, no actual push to do it. And what I would say is that outdoor learning actually solves every single perspective that I heard today. Parents who want an option to send their kids back immediately, outdoor learning can do that we, uh, through partnerships, right, strategically. Um, for people who are afraid to go back, we took a survey of 400 teachers. More than half of those teachers who said they do not feel comfortable coming back said they would feel more comfortable if it were outdoors. So no matter what the perspective is council members have heard today, outdoor learning is an option as the SBOE said unanimously, um, would help solve this. And all we need to do it is a fund because if the mayor or council approves that $4 million fund, anyone who wants to do it can, those who don't wanna do it don't have to. The schools have partnerships, so the burden is not on them to do it. And it solves for the health, safety, joy and education of our students and option for parents. And so it's really, um, it's really a solution that can speak to everything that um, folks are, are worried about today. Thank you, thank you so much for that. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member uh, Alyssa Silverman, who may not be back. Council Member Robert White. Council Member Pinto. And we've been joined by Council Member Henderson. I don't have any questions, Chairman. Thank you. Um, so sorry I'm moving us along, um, but all of the witnesses, te witnesses, your testimony is helpful. Those of you who haven't uh, given us statements, I've gotten a couple during the hearing, uh, please submit them. Um, thank you for your time. And uh, if you can stick around, um, I think not in the, in the room, in the other room, whatever it's called on Zoom, uh, we will get to the chancellor. Uh, so let me move on. Um, uh, Sasha Silverman, Allison Fiorillo, who's an assistant professor at Children's National Medical Center, Kathy Riley, Julie Parker, Sandra McCosco, Sandra, I apologize. I've always mispronounced your name, and that's my bad. Uh, Miranda Hansen Hunt, Bethany Rubin Henderson, Jessica Giles, Jasmine Rogers, Charles Boston, Camelia Keo, David Ifill. Suzanne Wells, Marlon Ray, Lewis Thomas, David Stevenson, Lena Johnson, Yolandra Hancock, and Maria Tukeva. I didn't cite affiliations, but I assume each of you will do that when you testify. Uh, we'll begin with uh, Sasha Silverman. Uh, hello. Hello. Hi. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, and I'm sorry that I wasn't here earlier. I was actually outside with my students. And so I'm in my home now and I'm perched at the top of my stairs because my son is in school and my husband is at work both virtually. Um, I am very fortunate to be able to leave the house every day and meet with eight pre-K students in the fields at RFK. 
Um, I'm just going to format my testimony based on some recent questions that I've gotten about outdoor learning. Um, we have been in session every single school day since the beginning of the school year, uh, completely outdoors from 9.30 in the morning till 4.30 in the afternoon. I have eight students. They range from pre-K three, pre-K four, and kindergarten. Uh, I am alone with my students for a portion of the day. I overlap with the co-teacher in the middle of the day. And then my co-teacher stays with the kids for a little bit of time at the end of the day while the parents come and pick them up. Um, we have been able to remain safe outdoors. We keep our masks on. The only time we take our masks off is when we're eating. We are able to have some developmentally appropriate physical contact, um, although we do try to keep the kids at a safe distance for most of the day. However, by being outdoors and keeping our masks on, the children are able to benefit from social interaction. Now, People always want to know how we manage to remain outdoors with the weather. And we have been very fortunate to be able to operate fully at the fields at RFK. They have a huge pavilion that's an outdoor shelter that's open on all sides that keeps us protected on the wet days. On our coldest days, the children are clothed appropriately. Um, and it's definitely a benefit of privilege that I work with families that are able to provide clothing that's appropriate for all weather for the students. We have not had one single day that we did not have a program outdoors due to the weather. We adapt to the elements. Um, there was a question about food. Families provide their own lunch and their own snack. We're either able to eat at tables that are already um, spaced nicely that are open at the fields at RFK, or we have pop-up tents, individual pop-up tents that the students bring. And so on the colder days, they can get cozy inside their pop-up tents and have lunch in there. Uh, a big question has been supplies. So surprisingly, it hasn't really taken much in the way of supplies in order to keep this program functioning. Um, we have the great benefit of the outdoors. Um, when you're outdoors with kids, it doesn't really require much in the way of supplies. I transport all of the supplies that I need for the day in a utility wagon from my house to the park. Um, we have in there all the materials that we need to get us through the day. I have a big foam mat that we sit on for circle time. I have a large pop-up tent that I set up with a library of books. We have a morning message board and a variety of other supplies that um, keep the children engaged throughout the day. In addition to that, the families have bought individual pop-up tents for each student. And again, they make sure that the students are clothed appropriately. Um, I'm just here to say that outdoor learning is a viable option. I have a, a child at home who is in, um, he attends Elliott High Middle School. He's been um, in the virtual platform since the beginning of the school year. He's on the computer about five to six hours a day. Um, it is an absolutely draining platform for him. And I am blessed with the ability to be outside with students and have those in-person connections. And I'm just here to share that it is a very, very safe, healthy, and viable option. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Silverman. Uh, Ms. Uh, Fiorillo? Is Allison Fiorillo here? Uh, Kathy Riley? Thank you. I uh, thank you for this opportunity to testify. My name is Kathy Riley, and I'm the director of the Senior High Alliance of Parents, Principals, and Educators, as well as a facilitator for the Ward 4 Ed Alliance and a member of C4DC. My experience is with listening to the parents, school leaders, staff, teachers, and students. And here I'm addressing specifically the challenges at the secondary level. While the hearing is about reopening, the real question is how can we serve all the students, whether they're in school or virtual? The pandemic has laid bare some of the stark inequities of our city. It has brought a higher infection rate to the 14th and 16th street corridors and a higher death rate towards seven and eight. Its effect on the minority communities in our city has been devastating. 
Further, given the vaccine shortage and the tenacity of the virus, the majority of the students are actually going to continue learning virtually. So given all of this, reopening is not going to solve the considerable issues before us in terms of learning loss or mental health stress on students, families, teachers. Returning in cohorts, cohorts often for one day or even half a day is not going to mean seeing your friends and your teachers or like it's being back in high school. So I think the first priority has to be what do we need to do to set up conditions for success? And the second one has to be do no harm. So we haven't really met those priorities yet and it would have been good to engage the school community sooner and you know, have them fully engage far sooner. And then we would have had confidence and we could have built from there. You know, so the ways you can help us now are schools cannot return regardless of risk. Ensure that the health metrics support a return. You'll find that out today when the health department but that would be key. Work with the DCPS secondary school leaders and social workers on what they need to work with the families and students heavily affected by the pandemic, but choosing not to return in person. Can the coordination with city agencies be stronger? Will the majority of students remaining virtual double down on the request from digital equity? Work with DCPS to have secondary staff that was assigned to the CARES classrooms and is still in the CARES classrooms to re return to their secondary schools. They need them. Work with DCPS to expand the eligibility to teach virtually to staff that is responsible for childcare. Many teachers live in the surrounding areas and they, their students, their children are not returning to in-person. We risk permanently losing their, those staff if we don't accommodate this. Reassess whether it makes sense to administer the park. It's not really a good diagnostic test to justify the stress on everyone of giving it virtually and taking it virtually. Um, reassess and further adjust the evaluation of impact and how it can be used to support rather than to punish. Plan and invest resources now in summer school and summer programs, both socially and academic. Ensure that next year's budget does not cut back on teachers, electives, support staff, co-curricular opportunities, which will be needed more than ever. Also, it would be helpful for us all to know what happened to the CARES money that came in March, how was it spent, and what's the plan for the larger amount of CARES money that's coming next. I'm not sure anyone feels they're doing a good or a great job, even though they are working harder than they have ever worked before, putting in more hours, and it's only January. But addressing the issues on this list will help. So I look forward to working with you and DCPS to do better. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Riley. I'm told that uh, Ms. Fiorillo uh, has just joined us. If you can a few minutes, please. Hi, thank you. Thank you for accommodating me. Um, so, so my name is Allison Fiorello. I'm a parent of a first grader. I'm also a scientist and molecular biologist at Children's National Medical Center. Um, and I'm a strong supporter of reopening schools. Um, as you can see, I'm working in person and I know I've been doing so since the pandemic begun and I know that it can be done safely. Um, as a parent, I see firsthand um, that remote learning is failing our kids. Um, and as a scientist, I know that the data clearly supports that the safe reopening of schools as soon as possible. Already our kids have fallen behind academically and will likely continue to until they resume in-person learning. Um, the World Health Organization urges that the closure of schools be used only when there are no other alternatives. In testimony I will submit in writing, I have sourced and cited the most recent review of the scientific literature and the American Pediatric Association findings in support of this action. Um, just one example that I wanted to give um, comes from comprehensive contact tracing that was performed in Italy where they went back to school in September when cases were rising. Out of 65,000 schools, only 1.8% of those schools had even one occurrence of COVID-19. Um, so it's strongly in support um, that, that children in schools are not key drivers of the SARS-CoV-2 spread um, and elementary schools can and should open. Um, and just to give you a, a personal perspective, um, this, this 
um, virtual schooling has taken a, a huge toll on my seven-year-old daughter, who's, who's been so overwhelmed and upset about Zoom school that sometimes she does not want to get out of bed. In the beginning of the year, we had to talk to a school psychologist because she started to have accidents again, and they attributed this to the trauma of not being in school. Um, she's constantly drawing pictures of herself in virtual school crying with red X's all over it. Um, and most recently, I learned that despite our best efforts, um, she has made no progress in reading since the beginning of the year. Um, my observations are backed up with, by scientific literature that has documented increased instances of anxiety and depression in children due to being out of school. Um, Moving forward, my biggest ask of DCPS, the council and all stakeholders is to use scientific data to guide your decision making. Most families, teachers and staff within DC do not have degrees in public health, epidemiology or virology. Therefore, the responses to surveys are largely informed by feelings that are not backed up by reason or data. For example, only 54% of respondents to my school's most recent parent survey said that an available vaccine would increase their comfort level with in-person schooling. And this is in, in stark contrast to the data showing that these vaccines have 90 and 95% efficacy. Um, this is just one example of why we cannot rely on the feelings of the community to make decisions that will affect our children for the rest of our, their lives. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fiorella, and uh, uh, please do submit your statement in writing. Uh, Ju Julie Parker. Hi, yes, hello everyone. Um, I'm here today as a DCPS parent of two kids to say that virtual learning is not working for my kindergartner. Um, most people, including health professionals, agree that virtual is not appropriate for the youngest kids. My expectations were low for this year, but the situation is far worse than my lowest expectations. My son has a very hard time engaging virtually um, and that now he's so far behind, he doesn't understand what's going on and essentially he just gives up. And you know, this is in addition with having many emotional outbursts. Um, I've spoken with many other families in the same situation and they're having the same experience and this is really not okay. Um, furthermore, my son did not get a spot in the very limited opening that's supposed to happen in February. So this means that his education will be completely virtual for more than a year. And this is not okay on so many levels, mental, social, emotional, physical. I ask that the council look to give all families who want it the option of in-person learning, including outdoor learning, the safest in-person option. Furthermore, please prioritize teacher vaccinations um, and plan ahead for term four, summer, and next year. We know a lot of kids will need remedial classes. What will this look like? And will, will schools get additional funding? Um, will DCPS lower its expectations? Um, will DCPS open completely next school year? I really need to know this because I can't keep on like this. We are spending, my family is spending three to $4,000 a month to have someone assist our kids learning. And as I've mentioned, it's not working. So, you know, nothing can really replace in-person learning for little kids. And at this point, we're just bleeding money. <laughs> so I just, I hope the council, <sighs> I hope the council <sighs> can push for opening in-person quickly and safely, working with the mayor, DCPS, WTU, and Vision Zero, so that everyone will support it. I would also like to put emphasis, especially from what I've heard today, is that different age groups have different needs and that this should really be put into consideration. I hope that schools can have as much clout as restaurants and bars do. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Parker. And if you could provide a copy of your written statement, that would be helpful. Ms. Moscoso. Chairman and council members, I'm Sandra Moscoso, a parent of two students at School Without Walls High School. I cannot wait Can to you get try my... to speak a little louder? Sure. I cannot wait to get my students in school with their friends and teachers I see clear reasons to create opportunities for students in dire need for social contact and services. 
My son is spending his senior year away from friends and my daughter is spending her freshman year struggling to create community. However, I don't feel I have sufficient information about whether my kids and their teachers and the rest of us will be safe um, at the proposed scale of reopening. And I do not understand how reopening decisions are being made, including what will trigger closing. What about families who cannot opt in for in-person? What, what is a plan to strengthen virtual learning and more importantly, mental health supports? There's no transparency, no discernible process, and in the end, no trust. Please push DC Health to create and share reopening and closure metrics and triggers. There's no transparency nor effort to promote sharing of information across private charter DCPS and um, daycares. The little data shared by DCPS and charters is fragmented across 75 websites. Please push DC Health to share data about testing and cases across all schools and daycares. Like many of our schools, Wall serves students across the city, yet there is no transportation plan to support safe access to and from school. Please push DCPS to work with WMATA to develop a real plan that goes beyond kids ride free cards. And mental health has not been prioritized and is critical. When we ask a school social worker to speak on about what she is seeing within our community, she insisted we focus on suicide prevention. This is terrifying. Our in-school resources are tapped and it's impossible to expect that returning to in-school instruction is the cure-all for the mental health epidemic we are facing. Please push DCPS and DC Health to invest in mental health supports for all families, including those who remain virtual. And finally, I'm really concerned about how the mayor and chancellor's rhetoric is hurting our school communities. I watch my children in class every day and I know teachers and staff are working hard, yet we keep hearing they need to do their job. I recently joined a parent group dedicated to opening DC schools. I hope to learn from parents how their schools are managing reopening. Instead, I have observed anti-union, anti-teacher conversations that eerily remind me of the anger-filled forums we have painfully had to face locally and nationally. Schools, like all institutions, rely on trust in order to work. While these families represent the minority sentiment, imagine having to go to work in a pandemic, knowing the families of the children you are serving are angrily trying to force you into a situation where you don't feel safe. And then imagine your boss is egging them on. We need our teachers and we need them to feel like we want our families to feel safe and supported. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Moscoso. And I have a copy of your statement, thank you. And I was incorrect, uh, Julie Parker, I do have a copy of your statement. The next witness is Miranda Hansen Hunt. Hi, I'm here. Dear council members, thank you for allowing me to testify today. I am a PhD candidate at Teachers College, Columbia University, and I've lived in Ward 5 for over five years. I am not a teacher or a parent but a concerned member of the community whose voice has not been heard. The reopening plan for DCPS has been presented as a fight between teachers who want to limit in-person teaching until it's safer and parents who want to give their children a good education. Little, if any thought has been given to those of us who do not fit into that dichotomy, which is not even a true narrative about the reopening plans. There seems to be endless surveys sent to parents and teachers while for 10 months, Various people in power have made decisions that they claim are in the best interest of taxpayers and voters without seeming to solicit those voices for themselves. So I am here and I want to be clear, I want school to open only when it's safer and there is no indication that it is safe right now. I've watched many of my friends leave this city for the suburbs because they plan on starting a family and do not feel the city is amenable to their plans. We have watched and talked amongst ourselves as people with power and privilege say they have to reopen schools, even as the disenfranchised people they claim to be in service of have indicated in surveys, testimonies, and meetings that they do not want this reopening plan. The mayor has said time and time again, we need to reopen schools to help those families that are the most vulnerable. But when those same families are given a voice, they've indicated they do not want to reopen like this. In student forums, the students themselves say they don't feel it's safe to return in person. I trust their voices over someone with power and an agenda. In my ward, teachers are crying in fear over being sent back as parents continue to push for better virtual and outdoor learning. 
As I contemplate where I may want to buy a house or start a family, the teachers and students fighting for months to keep each other safe by remaining virtual is never far from my mind. Forcing teachers back puts their families and communities at risk. I love this city. I hope to one day serve this city, but it is hard to defend this decision. The great thing about living in a city for me is the sense of community. We are all forced to depend on each other when we all live in such close quarters. I want to feel that I live in a city that takes the lives of teachers seriously and where the voices of all members of the community can be heard. Until then, it is not the tax rate that will drive people away from this city. I have read the reopening plans for DCPS and the plans are not tied to health metrics like they are in so many other districts where my friend teaches. It seems particularly cruel to send teachers back now when in two months those returning in person could be vaccinated and keep everyone safer. I grew up in Connecticut where affluent white voices are so strident that many administrators and teachers quit. People would tell stories about PTA meetings that sounded more like blood sports than community meetings. My own high school teachers would tell harried stories of harassing emails and late night phone calls from parents of kids in their classes and sometimes beg the kids to reason with their parents on the teacher's behalf. I know how powerful those voices can be, but please don't allow them to drown out the far larger chorus of voices from not just teachers and students, but also community members like myself who are asking we return when it's safer, that educators from childcare workers to teachers be given time to receive vaccinations and be prioritized for those vaccinations and that the reopening plans be tied to health metrics. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Hanson Hunt. And I have a copy of your statement. Bethany Rubin Henderson. Good afternoon, council members. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. I am Bethany Henderson, Chief Executive Officer for DC Scores, which for more than 25 years has provided free daily out of school time programming for more than 25,000 children in DC. This school year, despite being virtual, we're still partnering with 52 public and public charter schools in DC. And our focus since the pandemic began in March 2020 through today has been keeping students feeling safe, supported, connected, and hopeful despite the chaos swirling around them. Partnering with schools to help schools increase and manage school attendance to help keep kids engaged with school, whether they're attending virtually or not. OST programs like DC Scores remain as important as ever, whether we are in virtual, hybrid, or in person, because we continue to expand LEA's capacity to reach, to connect with, to engage students and their families, as well as support whole child education and help fill in some of those gaps. Among other things, OST partners and DC Scores continue to rapidly adapt to the needs of our partner schools so that we can contribute meaningfully to their goals and to students' achievement. We've done this through virtual soccer practice, poetry writing workshops, structured age-appropriate conversations about social justice, top, social justice topics that help students process the twin pandemics of COVID-19 and systemic racial injustice. We have played and will continue to play a critical role this school year, no matter how school operates in keeping thousands of DC's most vulnerable young people engaged in academics, enrichment, and personal growth. And we know our peer organizations are working hard to sustain similar connections. As DC PS and the charter schools prepare for in-person learning and think about what that means, we are here ready to remain strategic partners with our schools in supporting vulnerable students during distance learning and during in-person learning. Because of our deep relationships with students, families, and teachers and administrators, over 80% of SCORE's coaches or school teachers or staff doing a second shift with us still to this day. We are also eager and ready to partner with the city at large on piloting small group in-person enrichment outside in partnership with individual schools that could support and incentivize enrollment and participation, participation in the virtual school day, whether the programming takes place during the school day before or after. The power of engaging the full community in what happens in schools and engaging OST partners and expanding kids access can really best be summed up in a poem written by Jeffrey from the DC Scores Brightwood Education Campus team and Jeffrey's poem is titled What Matters. Amplifying the words of our young people is always important but during this time as others have suggested it's even more critical to hear their voices and here's what Jeffrey wrote. Should height matter? Should race matter? Should being young matter? Well it does not matter. Everybody is different and that's good. It shows how everybody is special. Being special doesn't mean having powers or being somebody with a lot of money. It's about being yourself and being the best person you can be in life. That's what matters. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Henderson. And we don't have a copy of your statement. 
Uh, Jessica Giles. Hello. Can you hear Hello. me? Yes. Great. Um, good afternoon, Chairman Mendelson and members of the Committee of the Whole. My name is Jessica Giles. I'm a Ward 7 resident, an equity advocate, and the Deputy Director of Education Reform Now DC. Earn DC is a nonprofit organization that fights to ensure that DC public education system justly and equitably serves all students. We are committed to advancing racial equity in public education and closing opportunity gaps. My testimony today will focus on how the mayor and DC council can ensure DCPS has a just and equitable COVID-19 recovery plan that includes high dosage tutoring. We can implement this now, regardless of in-person instruction, and I'll share how. The impact of COVID-19 has been challenging for all students, but black, brown, and immigrant communities have been disproportionately impacted, and it has taken a toll on our students' academic and social emotional well-being. Last December, Empower K-12 analyzed an assessment results for nearly 30,000 students in DCPS and public charter schools using historical and fall 2020 assessment data. They found that DC students are in a COVID learning and mental wellness slide with an overall loss of four months of learning in math and one month of learning in reading. Additionally, 77% of students reported they are concerned that their family will be exposed to COVID-19 and 45% report that their family's financial situation has become somewhat or significantly more stressful. DC must include high doses tutoring as part of its summer recovery plan. High doses tutoring is one of the most effective interventions in education. It adds about 216 days of additional learning or 1.2 years. A high doses tutoring program works by identifying a student in need of a tutor and providing that student with tutoring on a daily basis for pre-kindergarten and first grade students and three days per week for second through fifth grade students. There is one tutor for every two to three students and ideally tutoring, tutoring would be paired with an extended school day. This is similar to learning pods that some upper income families have used during COVID to mitigate learning loss. High school students could tutor in elementary schools through an elective class or community service, college students in middle schools through federal work study, and full-time two and four-year college graduates in high schools through AmeriCorps. Special consideration and flexibility would need to be made for students with different learning abilities who already have specific education requirements. We urge the prioritization of DC residents belonging to black, brown, and immigrant communities to participate as tutors. In the recently enacted COVID-19 phase four relief and omnibus education funding package, DC was allocated approximately $173 billion for the K-12 education stabilization fund, which could be used to fund the program. While this is an emergency intervention to address COVID-19 related learning loss, DC must make this program permanent. Before I close, I also urge the mayor and DC council to continue investing in education, closing the digital divide and expanding mental health supports for students and families. Thank you for allowing me to testify on how DCPS can have a just and equitable COVID-19 recovery. I will submit my testimony. Uh, thank you, Ms. Charles. I was gonna mention that. Jasmine Rogers. Good afternoon, Chairman Mendelson and members of the council. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, yes. good afternoon. My name is Jasmine Rogers. I am a Ward 4 Washington DC resident and a Ward 4 DCPS special education teacher. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Committee of the Whole for providing this time for members of the community such as myself to share our thoughts on reopening. My ask of this council is that we do not return to in-person learning until we meet transparent scientific metrics that indicate that it is safe to return. I ask that all teachers, staff, and students who desire to get a vaccination be provided with the ability to do so prior to return. Typically, I am one to watch and attend these sessions and applaud those who speak up. However, I can stay silent no longer. I do not want to die. It is not safe for students, staff, or teachers to return to in-person learning. I'm concerned that DCPS is not considering the humanity of educators and staff that serve our schools. According to a survey conducted by the Horace Mann Corporation, 77% of educators are working more than a year ago today, 60% enjoy their job less, 59% do not feel secure in their school district's health and safety precautions, and 27% say they're considering leaving their job, retiring early, or taking a leave of absence because of this pandemic. This session is being conducted virtually. This should be a glaringly obvious indication that we are not ready to return to in-person learning. 
It is not safe enough for the council who are adults with the ability to adhere to mass requirements and distance standards to gather in person for this round table. How is it safe for our most vulnerable children to return to their learning environment? What is the significance of sending students back now? February 1st marks the beginning of term three, which coincides with the date that schools are asked to reopen. It appears that this decision is solely based on the school calendar of DCPS, not transparent scientific metrics. We continue to hear that students must return to in-person learning. However, solutions proposed do not address the identified issue of learning loss. Students return to in-person will still be doing the majority of their learning on the computer. Many students will still be learning virtually, but in larger classes, leaving fewer opportunities for small group or individualized attention and learning. Students who need the most support are not the ones returning in person. As an interventionist, I urge you to consider what in-person learning will look like. Students will be required to wear a mask all day. They will also be required to remain in their same seat, also be on a computer and with the teacher from six feet away. Students will have support still given virtually and the opportunities for small group instruction and student collaboration will be limited. As a teacher of students with disabilities, please consider the children who need social cues, students with hearing loss and those who rely on visual cues in order to form words. For students with social or pragmatic disorders, wearing a mask removes many visual cues that students will get from the speaker. Masks also hide many nonverbal cues, such as smiling or facial expressions that are essential for our learners with additional social needs. While special education teachers will adjust by wearing a clear mask using supportive visual images and gestures and engaging in purposeful eye contact, it is important for the community to understand that our return to school will not be the same as it was prior to the pandemic. As an interventionist, I'm tasked with serving students that are often multiple years behind in reading or math. Every year I am able to serve and successfully help students gain access to the grade level curriculum. Every year I am able to help commit, I'm sorry, able to help a child who was several years behind attain grade level skills. I will continue to commit to this work, but can only do so if I'm alive. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rogers. Uh, and we have a copy of your statement and I was just given a copy of Ms. Henderson's statement from uh, DC scores. Thank you, Charles Boston. Uh, yes, good afternoon, Chairman. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Great. Um, greetings, Chairman and Committee on the whole. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. As the country embarks on a new presidency, new year, and hopefully new chapter of the COVID-19 pandemic, we are reminded of the opportunity to make decisions that will serve not only our small sphere of influence, but the District of Columbia on a whole. It's quoted by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? My question to the committee of the whole is what will you do for the, the district's most vulnerable, its students? With the recent ending of the Committee of Edu on Education, the expanding in academic achievement gaps and the inherent dangers of indoors learning for unvaccinated children, students, there's no greater decision this new committee could make than to commit to the safety and success of all students and individualized instruction, not only by content, but duration and delivery, because we must recognize the uniqueness of each student. The pandemic has proven that parents, students, and teachers need options. Imagine if all teachers could be united in celebrating the diversity of the learning needs within their classrooms outdoors. Hopefully this committee in whole or in part will focus on the context of the problem we face, which is mayoral control. I ask this committee to amend the, the PER of 2007 and give parents, students, and teachers a level playing field. When you empower teachers with options such as outdoor learning, they can engage in the craft of teaching equipped with the research-driven resources that ensure all students are learning. Students are enthusiastic about learning. Kindergarten through 12th grade will no longer be a dream, but an attainable reality. In closing, our democratic system of government is supposed to be based on checks and balances and divided authority. So not only do we need a committee on education, we also need a special committee on education because the current education system has failed parents, students, and teachers for decades in the District of Columbia. The closing of Washington Metropolitan is a textbook example of how DCPS decision makers and mayoral control has failed students. It is my sincerest hope that our newly formed council will have the political will to do what's right and protect our students who are our social and economic future. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify. 
Thank you, Mr. Boston. And I do have a copy of your statement. A uh, Camelia Keo. Yes, I'm here. Hi. Can you hear me fine? Great. Yes. Uh, greetings, council members and colleagues, and welcome to my virtual classroom, as you can see behind me. Um, my name is Camille Akio. I'm a science teacher in Ward 5. Like many educators, I have converted a space within my home to create a welcoming and somewhat normal place for students to see um, each day they log into class. Um, I'm here to address three things. One, the challenges I overcame while with virtual learning. Yes, there are many challenges, but as someone has mentioned earlier today, we adapt as teachers. Two, to express my love to return, but only when it's safe and it makes sense. And then lastly, to ju just address the language of returning and what that looks like from K all the way to 12. So as I begin, I want you all to, to consider those listening and council members the last time you had to run a virtual meeting and the responsibilities it entailed. Without assuming too much, I can really only speak to the PDs that I've attended both district wide and within my school. There's always a team, someone to run the technology, someone to run the chat box, someone to present. And that's great. But at me as a teacher, I am running the entire show by myself. And if I can swiftly do this, I will just share very quickly, this is my setup. I am my own team of having my desktop, running my PowerPoint, my laptop to monitor the students going in and out of the space, my, my iPad to run the chat box. These are all challenges that I've, I, I've developed in order to ensure that our students are being able to access a high quality education in the virtual space. It's not easy, but it's a lot. Um, as a secondary educator, uh, I'm being asked to return on February 1st. Now, I'm sure I can try to manage doing all of this, but not in, the, in person. Um, I'm being asked to not only have my four eyes on these four screens here, but to also keep an eye out on the 11 students in the room, monitoring them, telling them to keep on their masks in the virtual space. These models just don't work. And from a teacher perspective, we are doing everything we can to adapt. I understand that it is challenging and there are plenty of challenges with trying to teach science virtually. However, I, I've adapted to that to provide students with simulations using three to four different platforms, speaking to students, keeping them engaged for over 80 minutes. Me, myself, I know I struggle as an attendee to maintain my attention for over 15 minutes. I'm doing that with 80 minutes with 30 students in, the, in my virtual space. And now I'm being asked to do it in person and have an eye on 11 other students. Now I've heard from many other parents and other teachers. I understand that there are certain needs for certain populations of students, but this cannot be blanketed over K th all the way through high school. And I ask that we consider, let's focus our energy on elementary and what their needs are being in person and what we can do to kind of support the social emotional needs of our secondary students who are a little bit more self-sufficient and who may require additional supports like, I don't know, an online learning class or tax, learning how to do their taxes, just something that will support that's age appropriate for those students. Ms. Keo, thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, and I don't, I do not have a copy of your statement, if you would provide that. Yes, I will send that right over. Thank you. Thank you. David Ifill. Uh, I'm told he's not here. Suzanne Wells. Suzanne Wells. Can you hear me? Yes, I can now. All right, my name is Suzanne Wells. I'm the president of the Ward 6 Public Schools Parent Organization. On Tuesday, our organization held its monthly meeting and my testimony reflects our discussion on reopening. Parents expressed concern about teachers. Virtual learning has placed many pressures on teachers yet they have risen to the occasion. 
There's a fear teachers will leave the teaching profession due to the pressures they have been under this year. Teachers should not be blamed or shamed if they are not yet willing to come back to the classroom. Teacher evaluation should be fair and consider the extraordinary circumstances of this school year. School reopening should be based on health metrics. The Washington Post reported on Monday that it took 12 weeks for the death toll to rise from 200,000 to 300,000. The death toll has leaped from 300,000 to almost 400,000 in less than five weeks. The number of COVID-19 cases and deaths today is far higher than when schools were closed in March 2020. The high number of COVID-19 cases make many parents and teachers concerned about the ability to safely reopen schools. Part of safely reopening is linked with vaccinations. Teachers are to be vaccinated starting January 25th and you need two vaccinations three weeks apart. The opening of schools at the beginning of February does not give the city enough time to give teachers both doses of the vaccine and the schedule for reopening should be timed with the vaccine rollout. Teachers who return to the classroom should be at the front of the line for vaccinations and have both doses of the vaccine. In spite of concerns with the ability to safely reopen, all of our member schools have worked hard to develop reopening plans. Most of the schools are focusing on keeping schedules and teachers stable. There is a greater focus on bringing back younger students. All schools are focusing on bringing back students who are having difficulties with online instruction or who need support as part of their IEPs. The individual school reopening plans appear to be modest and safety concerns have driven the development of the plans. There is not unanimity of opinion among parents on whether to send their children back to school. Perceptions of safety drive families' decisions to return to school. Families are making decisions to send or not send their children back to school based on confidence of school safety plans, concerns with success of virtual learning or emotional well-being and or work and child care issues. Many families will not send their children back to school now because they believe COVID rates are too high. Flexibility and creativity can help us rise to the challenges this pandemic has created. We support calls for emergency outdoor learning infrastructure fund to support schools creating outdoor learning opportunities. We also believe efforts being led by nonprofits to create learning hubs at public housing units should be supported and encouraged. Safety has to be at the forefront of any school reopening plan. We need to respect decisions teachers and families make to protect their health, and we need to be creative and flexible until this global pandemic is brought under control. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wells. And I have a copy of your statement. I appreciate that. The next witness is Marlon Ray. Good afternoon, Chairman and Council members. My name is Marlon Ray, a Ward 8 resident, activist, and surrogate dad. I am currently Director of Strategy and Logistics at Lawrence E. Boone Elementary School, formerly Orr Elementary. And for the record, today is my first time taking leave being away from my school since March 13, 2020. As a DCPS employee, I am a mandated reporter obligated to report harm toward any child. And under the DC Whistleblower Act, I am obligated to report any wrongdoing. This issue is about life and death. Reopening more schools and classes in the height of this ruthless pandemic is equivalent to child abuse and safety neglect. Therefore, I must always be fully transparent to our families. COVID cases in DCPS elementary schools jumped from zero to 76 in a short seven week period. Those 76 confirmed cases rose to 93 five days later on January the 19th. And that excluding, that's excluding the effect, affected persons. In the last 10 months, more DC residents died from COVID than the total number of DC homicides in six years six years. Increased infections and deaths are imminent, regardless of the home testing kits or upcoming vaccines. Adults and children in schools are not required to get tested nor required to report findings if, if positive. The probability that your child will return home infected is very high with current reopening school plans. Four steps to create a better reopening school plan is listed in my testimony. The science is crystal clear. Many studies find that children become infected and spread COVID-19 as much as adults. If you believe in science, 
you have to accept uncomfortable truths. Distance learning is working and can work even better if fully funded. Don't believe the erroneous reports that all black children are falling far behind and desperately need in-person instruction. Maybe we can finally address the systemic inequality inequity issue. I just want families to be fully informed. In closing, missing are my fellow DCPS administrator voices due to the real threat of retaliation and retribution from DCPS. The recent firing of my principal, Dr. Carolyn Johnson, Jackson King and other rock star principals in the midst of COVID sent a strong message to leadership that DCPS promotes a culture of silence. Again, this is about life and death. Therefore, threatening my job security, even the anonymous death threat I received recently will not derail me from speaking up for our families, children, and educators. It is embarrassing that so many teachers testified today and not one administrator. Here's a takeaway for DCPS senior leaders. Leadership is not about being in charge. Leadership is about taking care of those in your charge. I'll end with a stanza from po poet Amanda Gorman's poem, The Hill We Climb, that's so fitting for DCPS. <laughs> We've learned that quiet is an always peace and the norms and notions of what just is, isn't always justice. I'm available for questions. You know where to find me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ray. And uh, we have a copy of your statement. Lewis Thomas. Hello, uh, Chairman and members of the Council. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Um, my name is Lou Thomas, and I am here as a DCS parent with two children at Bancroft Elementary School in Ward 1. Um, and I'm urging the Council to work with the Mayor, Vision Zero, DCPS, the State Board of Education, and the Washington Teachers Union to create and release a transparent plan to safely reopen schools for all the families that want to opt in. Um, and I want outdoor learning, which is the safest in-person option to be a major component of that plan, along with summer schools for students who have fallen behind. <clears throat> the funds requested by the State Board of Education for outdoor learning should be released. And I wanna second everything that the representative from Empower Ed has said. Um, virtual learning is failing too many of our children, including my own and the equity impacts are severe. With COVID numbers currently so high, uh, leaders should be planning, looking to other cities and countries that pre-vaccine figured out how to keep schools safely open throughout the pandemic and have plans ready for when the numbers get to a place that we can reopen. Prioritizing bars and restaurants, which are known spreaders of the virus over schools, which evidence suggests are not super spreaders, sends the wrong message to parents about what our leaders value. If the COVID numbers are too high for schools to be open, then bars and restaurants should have been long closed to get the numbers down. I know there has been a failure at the federal level of both leadership and funding, and hopefully that is improving. Um, prioritizing DCPS teachers and staff for vaccines is a very important step. And thank you all for working towards that. Schools are essential and real plans for reopening, including term four and summer, should have been released already so that parents can plan. Despite the best efforts of our children's teachers and the school administration, virtual learning is just really failing our son. Um, and I worry that it's doing more harm than good for his love of learning. You know, after high risk students are rightfully offered the in person positions uh, opportunities first, instead of the current lottery system, teachers should be consulted about what students are really not engaging with the virtual learning and be offered the available spots. Um, our schools administration and many of the parents at Bancroft are interested in outdoor learning, which could safely bring back more students. Um, but the administration is overwhelmed by all they already have on their plate. The safest choice should be the easiest choice. And I urge the council, the mayor, Vision Zero, and the, w, and the teachers union and others to work towards having that be an opportunity for all students and families that want it. Thank you for your time. 
Thank you, Mr. Thomas. And if you would give us a copy of your statement, I would appreciate it. I'll submit that now. Thank you. David Stevenson. Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee, my name is Dave Stevenson. Uh, my son is a fourth grader at School Within School and I'm here as his dad. I wanted to start by commending his teachers who have done a terrific job working super hard to make online learning work for him. It's a reminder of how relational teaching and learning really is. And when I tune in and listen, he's laughing with his teachers, he's talking to other kids. Not every day, some days are hard, um, some days are a struggle, but they've really done a good job to create and sustain a community. I, I'm not here with a point of view on reopening when or how. Uh, I think that I don't have the expertise to determine what the right metrics are. Um, and I don't have a decision in front of me right now whether to send him back. But what I am here to say is that the plans I'm seeing risk substantially degrading our students' learning experiences uh, by trying to do some hybrid solution that's a little bit of this and a little bit of that and does everything poorly. I think if you reflect on your own experience leading Zooms like this one, you'll realize that you can develop relationships, you can communicate effectively in this medium and you can do it in a room full of people but I think we're about to ask a whole bunch of teachers and a whole bunch of kids to try to simultaneously balance being in front of a room full of kids and talking in a computer at the same time. That's what hybrid learning is gonna look like. And I think that's gonna be worse for the kids who are at home, having to watch for a webcam in the corner, what's going on in the classroom that they're not in. And I think it'll be bad for the kids in the room that half the time their teacher is worrying about what's happening in the Zoom box and trying to attend to the chats and everything else at the same time they're in the room. So in sum, if we're in a world of hybrid, I think there are systemic decisions that schools and districts can make about who does what kinds of teaching. There are districts in this country that tried in the fall to come back in hybrid modes. I can point you towards them. And what they found was they needed to assign some teachers to online who could really run a good Zoom class with breakout rooms and conversations and assign some teachers to in-person who could put themselves in a safe situation and attend to the kids in the class. I'm deeply concerned that the experience that we've had this year, which is okay, not as good as in person, is only going to get worse as we try to struggle through a spring of hybrid learning. Thank you very much for the chance to share my point of view. Thank you, Mr. Stevenson. Lena Johnson. Yes. Good afternoon, members of the Committee of the Whole, and thank you for the opportunity to deliver a testimony. My name is Lena Johnson and I'm the director of the Early Childhood Program at Bria Public Charter School, a two-generation program that educates young children and parents together. We serve about 65 pre-K students and 180 infant and toddler students annually. Since September, we have been operating an optional blended learning program where preschool families choose between learning two days a week on site and three days virtually or opt for entirely virtual instruction. Currently, about 50% of our families have opted into the blended learning. We would be able to serve 75% of our students on site following the OC health and safety guidelines. In preparing for the school year, we studied many year long outdoor learning models already in place around the country to inform our infrastructure and logistics. We also developed an outdoor learning guide as well as a blended learning math and literacy guides. These guides lay out a scope and sequence of study and concept and include specific activities teachers and parents can choose from when working on these concepts and skills on site and at home. We also use the summer and beginning of the school year to purchase all necessary PPE and air filters and to train staff and students on the health and safety guidelines. We are now four months into outdoor learning and can see the many positive effects the outdoor learning has on our students. Operating a blended learning model that connects outdoor and virtual learning closely with each other is not an easy task. There are three things that have made blended learning successful for us. First, our co-teaching model. Second, the alignment between our outdoor and blended learning guides and materials and the professional development we did to ensure that all students are getting access to the same high quality instruction, regardless of the model they are enrolled in. And third, the shared planning time for co-teachers to develop and connect both virtual and outdoor learning activities for each week. This is how we operate. One co-teacher with an assistant leads the outdoor program for the first two days of the week with cohort A, Monday, Tuesday, while the other one leads the virtual instruction on those Tuesdays. On Thursdays and Fridays, the other co-teacher with a different assistant leads the outdoor learning program with cohort B, while the co-teacher leads the virtual instruction. 
On Wednesdays, both co-teachers teach virtual instruction together and use this time with all students to intentionally repeat concepts and key vocabulary from the outdoor and virtual learning across cohorts. This schedule allows us to continue with our bilingual model. Students receive two days uh, of Spanish and two days of English instruction per week, and then Wednesday is a bilingual instructional day with lots of bridging opportunities. Both our staff and families have shared that this new model works for them um, as much as it can. And we have found that rather than seeing the outdoor learning and virtual instruction as two separate programs, both learning opportunities seem to enrich and strengthen each other. Currently, our outdoor learning program includes two hours of on-site learning per day. Moving forward, we want to increase the daily hours on site, which we hope will also make the outdoor learning accessible to more families. Thank you for your dedication to this issue and the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Uh, I don't have a copy of your statement. Sorry, I will submit it. Thank you. And I neglected to uh, remind Mr. Stevenson, I don't have a copy of his statement. I will send it to him. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Yolanda Hancock. I'm here. I'm in the middle of teaching a public health class. So I'm pleased to be speaking before you guys today. All right, let me just pull my statement up. I uh, thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony. I'm Yolanda Hancock. I'm a pediatrician, an obesity specialist, and a public health expert. I have previously served as the Associate Director of Children's National Medical Systems Obesity Institute, and I'm a professor at the Milken Institute School of Public Health at the George Washington University, where I'm currently teaching a class, but wanted to make sure I presented here today. I'm proud to say that before becoming a physician, I was an elementary school teacher. Today, I emphasize the urgency that we do everything possible to prioritize money and resources towards creating outdoor learning options as a healthy way to bring children back to school. The American Academy of Pediatrics in their return to school guidelines list using outdoor spaces as a priority tool for bringing children back to school. The environment created since March of last year for our children has resulted in an excess of indoor sedentary time, especially for our DC children east of the river in wards seven and eight. COVID-19 increases risk factors for obesity through increased stress and decreased physical activity related to environmental, academic, and social changes. Online education lacks physical education, class, recess time, and normal levels of active movement for our children. Hybrid education often schedules physical education as virtual sessions. With children at home and isolated, access to opportunities and environments that support physical activity are decreased. These factors further worsen the, con the concurrent pandemic of pediatric obesity that runs parallel to the COVID-19 pandemic. During this pandemic, my pediatric colleagues and I have noticed a worrying trend. Prior to the pandemic, youth made up the fastest rising group dealing with severe obesity. We are now seeing an increase in overweight and obesity among children that is likely causally linked to the combined impact of stress and increased sedentary time resulting from this pandemic. Before the pandemic, roughly 34% of children in Washington, D.C. carried the burden of being overweight or obese with this percentage being even higher among black and brown children in the district. The condition of being overweight or obese is more than an issue of weight. Obesity affects a child from head to toe, from increasing risk of chronic diseases like type two diabetes and hypertension to impacts on development and academic performance. Obesity is also associated with worse outcomes during a COVID-19 COVID infection, inclusive of death. With there being an almost 40% higher risk of COVID-related death of those dealing with obesity. While we consider the safety and timing of returning to returning our children back to in-person school, I'm asking that you create an emergency fund dedicated to outdoor learning infrastructures, prioritizing schools within communities that experience inequitable resources for children to engage in innovative strategies of combining outdoor learning with physical activity. We know that movement and being outdoors are essential tools in addressing stress and managing the health and wellness of our children during this pandemic. Peer-reviewed research shows that being outdoors for learning is academically robust, with masks and physical distancing creates a safer space for learning and significantly lowers viral transmission compared to any indoor activity, facilitates treatment and prevention of pediatric obesity, and promotes overall physical and mental health wellness. As a pediatrician and former elementary school teacher, I ask that you strongly consider 
creating an emergency fund for outdoor learning to make funding immediately available so that our schools who want and need to enjoy this option can. Several examples have already been demonstrated across the country during this pandemic. Children living in our most under-resourced wards deserve equitable opportunities to reach their full academic and health potential. Studies have demonstrated that sitting longer than three hours a day can cut our lives short by two years. Creating these safe spaces for learning is not only an evidence-based way to improve health and academic performance, it truly is life-saving. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hancock. Uh, Maria, and we don't have a copy of your statement, if you would provide that. Maria Tukeva. Pardon? Uh, Maria Tukeva. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Thank Mr. You. Chairman, council members and staff. My name is Maria Tukeva and I'm the founder and principal of Columbia Heights Education. Tech is a six through 12 dual language immersion campus in Ward 1 located at 16th and Irving Streets Northwest. Our school serves 1,480 students of which 53% are English language learners and 18% are special needs students. Since the start of this year, we've been able to offer a full middle school and high school curriculum virtually. Our teachers have done an amazing job of transforming their instructional practices, learning new platforms, strategies and applications. Similarly, our students and parents have also done an incredible job of learning new ways of learning, organizing and managing their time, and utilizing technology. Virtual learning has worked very well for some of our students, and some are thriving. We also know that some of our students are struggling in the virtual environment, and we know that we must do other things to reach these students. Our planning for Term 3 reopening began with the creation of a reopened community core and a design process. To inform our planning, we administered a survey of all students and parents to determine the demand for in-person programming and what they most wanted to experience in school. Based on the survey results, 40% of parents and 49% of students wanted some kind of in-person experience. Additional data on student needs and desires revealed, 60% of the students wanted one or more content classes in person. 43% wanted some kind of recreational, sports, social emotional learning, or cultural activity. 29% wanted small group tutoring, 28% wanted college and career assistance, and 18% wanted counseling services. Based on this feedback, we worked in teams of administrators, teachers, and counselors to create grade level plans, to bring back six cohorts of 11 students per grade, approximately 400 students in total. We have worked to identify students most in need for these cohorts based on ELL status, Spanish as a second language learner status, special education status, or their first semester grades and attendance, as well as teacher and parent recommendations. As a result, each grade has a differentiated plan responding to student and parent needs. We will be offering a variety of different experiences, including small group tutoring, content classes taught in a combined teaching approach, counseling, college and career preparation, career and technical education labs, art therapy, co-teaching, as well as one outdoor learning cohort. Along with our cohorts, we developed a staffing plan. Throughout the process, we met weekly as a reopened community core and shared all plans and ideas with parents and students, as well as generated feedback and improvements in the plan. We're now in the process of offering seats via email and phone outreach and scheduling students. We are preparing for student and parent town halls this week and next to share the protocols and norms for in-person learning. So far, we've offered 420 seats and about 50% have accepted their seats. As we look forward to term free in-person learning, we plan to implement our reopen plan and health protocols with fidelity and refine and adjust as needed. Our first priority will be on safety and health for all staff and students. And we plan to continuously analyze and reflect upon our experiences in order to provide information and recommendations to policymakers. At the same time, we remain committed to refining our virtual program so that the students remaining virtual continue to achieve. I look forward to ongoing collaboration with all stakeholders and policymakers as we continue in this extremely important work to provide in-person learning for our students. Thank you for the opportunity to share my testimony today. Uh, thank you, Ms. Tukeva. Uh, I'm gonna ask a quick question of you and uh, try to be brief and urge my colleagues to be brief so we can get to the chancellor. Uh, Ms. Tukeva, 
if roughly half of the parents want to uh, return, that means roughly half don't. Um, so how much opposition is there? Or is, uh, are there parents who are being forced to send their kids back when they don't want to? Or teachers being forced to come back to school when they don't want to? It was 40% of the parents wanted some kind of learning. So the parents who wanted it were the ones that we reached out to. So those that answered the survey and said, we want to come back in person, we reached out to them. In addition, for some parents who didn't answer the survey, if there were students that we saw were really struggling. We reached out to them to see if they wanted to some kind of in-person service. Um, they were told always that they could stay virtual if they wanted to. What about teachers? Are they being forced to come back when they don't want to? The process used with teachers was who volunteered to come back were first used for a staffing plan. First determined what did we need in terms of funding. Those that volunteered were first, first ones put into the staffing plan. Then there was a randomized ranking process that uh, DCPS used to give numbers to teachers, randomized numbers. And based on that ranking number and the needs of what kind of classes we need, those were the teachers who were selected to come back. Thank you. Uh, I'd probably ask more questions, but this round of questions stands between us and the chancellor. Councilmember Gray, do you have any questions? Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. Uh, I am unmuted, I hope. Yes, you are. Okay, great. Uh, I just wanted to ask uh, Lena Johnson, she testified earlier as the uh, Director of Early Childhood uh, uh, Services at Berea uh, Public Charter School. Um, I'm, I'm curious as to what, uh, Ms. Johnson, you may have, have observed about whether uh, our education, our current educational environment in this COVID environment we're having to operate within. Um, what, what, what are your assessments? What assessment do you have of the social, emotional uh, services uh, reaching out to our children and their parents uh, that's being provided uh, to our children and their parents uh, at this stage? I've, I've spent a good bit of my time working um, for some time now um, in, uh, with early childhood education. And I would really love to know what you believe the impact has been on our very youngest learners um, about um, the environment they're having to function in, this COVID environment they're having to function in, which is incredibly unique, uh, it seems to me. And maybe unique is an understatement to say the least. So uh, do you have some thoughts on that, Ms. Johnson? Yes, that's a big question. Um, I don't think I can answer it fully right now, but um, talking about you know, our pre-K students, um, we have found right. uh, that you know most of, a lot of the conversation has to be with the parent, right? So um, if it's only the conversation with the student, it's very hard to uh, help a three-year-old be on Zoom on time or participate when there are other things happening. And so um, one of the things we do is that, you know, parents have a weekly communication, um, a phone call or Zoom conversation with the teachers and check-ins um, to see how they're doing, what they need, and then talk with them about the support for the child. Um, we share a weekly newsletter with the parents with activities they can do at home and resources. Um, and in addition, we have um, social workers at our school who reach out to families who need support to help them find you know, other resources in the community. Um, and so uh, it's, yeah, it's so much more. The teachers are doing so much more than just just teaching, right? It's it's a lot of um, a wraparound. Question. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, do you do your colleagues reach out to others in the early learning environment to connect with them around what the uh, emotional, uh, social emotional impact is on young learners in this environment that we've had to function in now? Yes. Yes, and we're really lucky because we are, you know, partner, partnered with Mary Center, the, the yeah. health clinic, and so we, we, we collaborate closely with the, um, the staff with Mary Center and have the services available to our students. What about, what about those within the public, D.C. public schools environment who are dealing with early learning also? 
Yes, yes, we're, we're um, you know, open to collaborate. This is really important to learn one school from the, the other and nobody has the answers right now. So I think, yeah. we, you know, any webinars, any collaborative team meetings, um, yes, try to participate. Okay, I appreciate that. I want to ask the chancellor about this when we get to it too, because, you know, we, we're dealing with uh, very, very young kids who, you know, will be negatively or positively uh, impacted by this environment. And I fear that some of them are going to be negatively impacted uh, by this environment. And what are we doing to be able to stem uh, yes. some problems? That's what, and that's what we have seen that when we allow families to come on site and be outside together, um, it's, you cannot replace it. Even the teachers right. who, you know, were hesitant or, or, or parents who weren't sure, but once they were on site and they had the face-to-face -face interaction, it just made such a big difference that uh, it changed. The impact is it's amazing to see how different it is for children to learn when they are, you know, with the teacher in the same space. Right. I appreciate your input on this. And, uh, you know, we, 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 we're, going, we're going to be reaching out. I'm certainly going to be one of those reaching out to you and your colleagues uh, in the early learning environment to be able to best understand know what kind of uh, impact this COVID environment is having on our very youngest uh, of children and uh, what do we need to do uh, to benefit from uh, the learning that should be taking place by the professionals uh, in, in the field of early learning. So thank you very much for your uh, testimony. I appreciate it and your questions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Councilmember Gray. Councilmember Treon White, do you have any questions? Council member uh, Janice Lewis George. Uh, th thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm going to, I'm anxious to get to the Chancellor. So I just want to thank everyone who, who testified. And my question is for you, uh, Chairman, actually, is um, we've heard a lot of testimony today about a plan for this summer uh, and a plan uh, uh, for outdoor. And so I hope we can host another one of these um, to really explore the, um, that, those options and see where we are. Uh, in a month to, to make sure we can update those. I am very interested in the out of time programs that were mentioned uh, by various um, uh, stakeholders on this call. And so I, I, I'm anxious to get to the chancellor. So I wanna thank you all and I will follow up individually for those who I have further questions. Thank you, council member. Council member Silverman, do you have any questions? I do not, Mr. Chairman. Um, just wanna thank all the witnesses. Thank you, council member Robert White. Uh, yeah, I want to uh, thank the witnesses and uh, apologize in advance for, for being brief because I do want to make sure we have time for the chancellor. Uh, but since we have Ms. Johnson here, and I apologize if I missed this in your testimony, uh, for the outdoor learning, uh, how do you make that work on days when the temperature is below freezing? Well, so depending on who defines freezing, right? Or like what is cold and what isn't. So we had to, you know, come up with our own policies. So when there is days of constant rain, we go into full virtual learning um, because we're not prepared to, we don't have the infrastructure outside to do learning when it's pouring, when it's raining. Um, we, our children have, we, we are able to have rain gear and winter gear, but it's really hard to be outside for a few hours in a row when it rains. So you know, then we just choose, we inform the parents and the families and the teachers the day night before that the next day will be virtual learning. And the same with, if it's extreme cold um, or there's hail or, you know, something very strong, then we would close um, and have just virtual learning that option for everyone. Okay. R roughly what, what temperature would cause you to close? I think below 20, deg 20 degrees. Oh, okay. Uh, and finally, uh, what, what percentage of your students are, are participating in in-person learning? 50, 50%. Thank you very much. Thanks so much to, uh, to this panel of witnesses. Thank you, Councilmember White. Councilmember Henderson, if you have any questions. Um, yes, Mr. Chairman, I do, do have one question for um, Ms. Keogh, if you're still on. She was the high school teacher who teaches science. Middle school. Middle school, sorry. Um, uh, I, I had a question, could you sort of talked about that you will be going to in-person instruction and, or you've been asked to come back. Um, and we've been trying to get answers from, or haven't really heard a lot from DCPS in terms of the models being offered for the older students. Did I hear correctly that you will have students in your classroom, but also be teaching students virtually simultaneously? So that, 
that's part of my concern is getting some clarity on what these actually would look like. Um, the models that were laid out, there are four different models that are laid out. The one that we have is that teachers will be virtually teaching. So essentially my setup that I have here, I would be taking that into the classroom and be given the, the 11 students that have opted to come in and monitor their online learning in their space. So that was the model that we had adopted at our school um, because of the way that our teacher, we have teachers who teach, teach different content and because of ADA and personal reasons, not every teacher will be returning. So therefore I would not be able to teach outside of my content. So I will be teaching virtual teaching science to students at home if they are in person um, they would turn on their computer and have to look at me on the screen or maybe side oh, eye me. Oh, I see. So the students in your classroom would be logged on virtually while Correct. you're giving instruction in person. Correct. But they would also, there is a possibility that they would be, be doing virtual learning in other spaces. So they would be in science or English or math in another space because of trying to reduce the amount of movement students would be locked in the classroom from nine until 4 p.m., including having lunch being brought to them. So that's what it looks like for the secondary space, uh, or at least that's the model that we are following. And that's where my concern is, how am I supposed to do this and support the tech of students who are in that space? Okay, and so what it looks almost like, like they are combining care classrooms Correct. With a virtual for the secondary. Okay. Um, Principal Takeba, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, but since she's here, I just was curious in terms of what the model check um, will be using if you're still on. Is that a similar thing as what Ms. Keo? Um, um, it's a little bit different, and each grade is going to be different. So, for example, in the 12th grade, uh, there's a group of 11 kids will come in with the AP English teacher. And at the same time, that AP English teacher will be teaching a virtual class. So, like, there might be kids that are there with them, and there's a webcam that films them as they're teaching. What um, the combined teaching model will look like. We also are having a model where a special education teacher will come in, and teach 11 special education students. And those special education students will go on their virtual classes. Special education teacher will be with them person help them navigate their classes because that's where they are. So those are some examples of different things that we're doing. As well okay. As we have counseling, uh, college and career counseling. So it's all very different according to the Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilmember. Uh, we've been joined by Councilmember Charles Allen. Do you have any questions? Uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, thanks, everybody. I'll try to be brief because I know we're trying to get to the chancellor. You know, one of the challenges I think I keep hearing, I heard at least Mr. Stevenson, and I think a couple of folks refer to this, was that you know we've got a problem where we have a bunch of teachers who aren't confident about being able to go back safely into the classroom. Um, and then we have parents who might want to go back in the classroom ultimately, but they also don't want to have their teachers uh, be put at risk. And so they're trying to help support their teachers and it's creating so much conflict. Um, and then Mr. Stevenson, I heard you talk about the concern of what'll happen in the, what, what would happen for the, uh, the changes that would take place in the virtual classroom um, and what that will now mean for educators as well as for the families. Um, I know I think about it on, on the home front here. I mean, I've, I've got a, uh, a DCPS kid who our options are um, go back into the classroom. That's if we were to get a seat um, where we'd alternate one week on, one week off, the week on be in person there, but then the week off be home while broadcasting or simulcasting rather than having the direct instruction, um, which sounds like that's going to be a not the same type of virtual experience. Or if we don't get a seat there to go in person or choose not to go in person, then we're just 100% simulcast, um, where I think that's a very different virtual experience. Um, so Mr. Stevens, can you talk a little bit more about what your school community is wrestling with um, as it comes to the in-person learning as well as the concerns about what the impact would be on, a, on 
while virtual is not ideal, now that we've been doing it for several months, there is some level of where it's working for some people, and this also will now disrupt what we already have. Sure. Thank, uh, thank you, Council Member Allen. Uh, our community, we have teachers who are afraid of going back to school. I think reasonably so. I, again, I don't know the safety protocols that would or wouldn't make it safe. I think it probably could be done, but right now they're quite concerned. Um, we also have parents for whom virtual learning isn't working well at all, right? And their, their kids, you heard many of those stories, I think, today of you know, kids who are angry, frustrated, falling off, et cetera. Um, the thing I'm worried about, again, is just that you, you called it simulcasting, right? That we're in dialogue right now, right? If you were talking to a room full of people and I was sort of peeping in from a webcam, we're not in dialogue anymore. And that's not no longer an educational experience. And at that point, you start asking questions like, why aren't we just streaming this stuff anyway and just recording some teacher in the corner? But that's not how teaching and learning works. It works in relationships between adults and kids and between kids and kids. And I, I fear that as tenuous as those relationships are right now, we're about to do significant damage by trying to adjust in ways that are just untenable the ways that we expect adults and kids to work with one another. So those are the issues we're wrestling with. It's a mess. I don't have a great idea about how to solve it. I just wanted to express my concern that whatever little glimmers of hope and cheer are happening in my fourth grader's life, we're about to substantially erode them by forcing him to just be an observer of like a security camera instead of a participant in a joyful classroom. Yeah, that may, I mean, as a DCPS parent, that makes perfect sense as I think about my own third grader's experience. Um, and if it were to all of a sudden be changed to just watching a room. And I've, I've talked with teachers um, that, that teach in other jurisdictions that have been doing the simulcast. And, and they say it's, it's just incredibly hard because of course they're gonna focus on the students who are in their classroom in front of them. And it's hard almost even remember there's a whole group of students out there. And that's not a failure of the educator. That's just human nature is when you have people in front of you, that's who you're kind of speaking to. So it's just a fundamentally different experience and it really stresses and strains that student teacher relationship. Um, the, the other piece I just wanted to note real fast, I, I think I heard uh, Suzanne Wells talk about this. I have not heard enough at all from DCPS about what the aftercare and other community-based type of models, you know, we have a lot of hubs in Ward 6 and other places that can really help support the whole student to meet the student and the families where they are, to meet their needs where they are. And I have yet to hear from DCPS a real plan around how to partner with those organizations um, to help make sure that those kids uh, get what they need, those families get what they need. Um, Suzanne Wells has talked about this a bunch and, and has really been a great champion for, for trying to help us focus on that. And I just haven't heard DCPS talk enough about it and I hope we hear more about that. Um, I know my time is up and we wanna move on to the chancellor. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Uh, and that is gonna conclude the questions from members. I wanna thank each of the witnesses and um, you're all excused. You can continue to watch, uh, but you'll be excused from this room. And I'm now going to call um, uh, Dr. Lewis Farabee, who's the Chancellor of the District of Columbia Public Schools. And if he has joined us, Dr. Shah from the Department of Health. Confirming that you can hear and see me? Um, not yet. I think we're still in the process of excusing folks from the um, panelist room. I actually can see you, but uh, as I said, we're trying to um, excuse folks from the panelist room. Um, let me check with my staff. Okay, uh, Dr. Farabee, do you want to proceed? Uh, I, I don't know if you heard this. Um, you're supposed to be joined by Dr. Shah from the Department of Health, who's not giving a statement, but will be available to answer questions. Uh, so we'll let him in when he arrives. And uh, 
I have your statement. I don't know if the other members have your statement, but it should have been sent out to everybody. Okay, I'm happy to start. I wanna confirm that you can hear me. I can hear you. Okay, perfect. I don't know if anybody else can hear you, but I only care about myself. <laughs> I can hear him. All right, that means Councilman McGray can hear me as well. Okay. Good afternoon again, Chairman Mendes and members of the committee of a whole and staff. I'm Dr. Louis D. Fairby, Chancellor of the District of Columbia Public Schools. I appreciate the opportunity to share an update on DCPS reopening work and our plan to expand in-person learning beginning on February 1st at the start of term three. Despite the challenges of COVID-19, I remain grateful for the inspired work and the resilience of our DCPS family, staff, students have shown during this unprecedented health emergency. I also want to recognize the horrific events in our city over the past weeks and highlight our continued need to fight for our deals. Currently, 79 DCPS schools are offering in-person programming to approximately 1,000 students in over 140 care classrooms, which provides students the opportunity to get back into their school with their peers while continuing to learn virtually. Of the students who have accepted a seat in a term two care classroom, approximately 90% meet one of our priority criteria, including 61% are designated as at risk, 26% receive English language learning services, 26% receive special education services. We're also proud to share the success of our initial in-person learning pilot at Brent Elementary, Ross Elementary, Kimball Elementary, which have operated for approximately two months. DCPS has remained grounded in the firm belief that a safe and healthy in-person learning opportunity is the best way to teach and reach our students who are facing significant barriers to success with virtual learning. It is our goal to provide opportunities for students to return to school and receive the critical supports they deserve. We know this is particularly important for our youngest learners as gaps in early literacy, social emotional development, and access to quality learning experiences have long-term impacts on students' success. With the expansion of in-person learning programming, we have remained grounded in the guidance and the science from DC Health and the Center for Disease Control. In addition to Mayor Bowser's $31 million investment in school safety measures, we've established a clear protocol for tracking and responding to incidents of COVID-19 in schools. Schools now have both rapid and PCR COVID-19 tests in individual that shows any symptoms during the course of the day. In addition to our symptomatic testing protocols at schools, we've also instituted asymptomatic testing protocols allowing tests every 10 days for students and staff participating in DC public schools in-person programming. When we identify possible exposure or a confirmed case, we move quickly to investigate and perform necessary safety mitigation. We also include the self-quarantine of close contacts and possible temporary quarantine of a classroom cohort. As we look forward to welcoming back more students and staff, we continue to follow all guidance from DC Health uh, supported by the findings recently released by the American Academy of Pediatrics, underscoring that schools do not significantly increase community transmission and highlighting the importance of reopening schools to support healthy child development and well-being. We will continue to post daily data around the results of these tests and any notifications that go out to our schools. In my school visits to care classrooms across the city, I've seen DCPS students who are excited and eager to get back to the classroom with their peers. They have demonstrated the ability to quickly adapt to new routines and fully comply with our established health protocols. In recent months, DCPS has heard a call for a more engaged and flexible community approach, including this from the DC Council. When it comes to our reopening plans, and as a result, we've started a new process and we look forward to the start of term three. We're proud to share that our work of our school leaders and our reopening community course, which have prioritized engagement and planning that is in response to their unique school context. School leaders have collaborated with a group of diverse individuals, which include 12 to 15 staff members, educators, parent and student voices 
in their school. They review feedback from elementary and secondary family learning preferences surveys led with equity to prioritize students with the highest need and help school leaders design a tailored reopening plan for their term three reopening. We're also proud that we've worked collaboratively with the Washington Teachers Union to finalize an agreement that represent our shared commitment to ensuring that we have high quality education and supports that students need to thrive. We continue to host bi-weekly meetings to hear from our labor leaders and ensure that their planning is reflective of our insights that we need where possible. Learning models will vary across schools based on the needs and feedback of each of the communities, groups and their planning, which may include in-person learning classrooms with teachers, care classroom, tutorial services with staff facilitators, a self-contained classroom for students with disabilities. Each school's reopening plan reflects family demand and will be able to serve approximately up to 30% of the student population and in person, depending upon the staffing and classroom space. As of earlier this week, we had approximately 4,000 students that have already accepted a seat for term three, and that number continues to grow. We look forward to welcoming up to 15,000 students in in person programming in term three while also maintaining virtual options for families who prefer it. As I shared earlier this month, DC Health anticipates beginning our vaccination distribution process for staff working in educational facilities beginning the week of January 25th. DCPS is working closely with DC Health on this effort and we are proud to partner with Children National to provide a dedicated vaccination site at Dunbar High School for DCPS and contracted staff who will be working in person. Despite the challenges of the public health emergency, DCPS remains committed to creating an environment that will eliminate opportunity gaps, interrupt institutional bias, and remove barriers of academic and social success. We know that our younger scholars and our students furthest from opportunity will benefit from this the most in our in-person learning and we're continuing to commit to adapting our programming aligned to the guidance from DC Health and the changing needs of the COVID-19 pandemic. Over the next several months, and we will continue this throughout the school year, we will work to accelerate student learning while also ensuring that all of our DCPS students have a health and safety return to in-person learning. In this school year, which has been none like other, DCPS continues to pivot and maintain our commitment to health and safety for our students, families, and community. In this partnership, we value the relationships with our school community, with the DC Council, and remain committed to operating in good faith to build trust, increase transparency, and also to provide students with joyful learning experiences, whether that be at home or in the classroom. I also want to share my appreciation for the DCPS teachers, school leaders and staff and highlight their work to provide quality programming options in term two, along with our value agency partners and their commitment to our families. Thank you for our opportunity to testify today and share our plans for reopening schools. I look forward to answering questions that you have at this time. I know many others have also highlighted the ongoing service for our very own Andrew Washington. I do want to recognize him as a long-standing leader for DCPS and also a DCPS graduate. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Chancellor. Um, we, we're gonna have a, a 10 minute round and then see if we uh, can squeeze in another round for members and there could be eight members who are present. I'm gonna start with a couple of questions. Uh, the first is, um, we and I'm going to really direct us, I think, first to Dr. Shah, who's joined us. Uh, we've received testimony over the last four hours that um, it is unsafe for parents and for kids and teachers to reopen. And uh, because kids can carry disease home, it'll be unsafe for parents. Uh, we also received testimony that, in fact, um, schools are not the spreaders and we don't need to be as concerned. And, that what DCPS uh, is proposing um, is consistent with CDC guidelines. Uh, there really is though, in the first camp, very strong feelings, I would say fear, that um, it's just 
not safe. I'm going to emphasize safe for schools to uh, reopen. Um, so, Dr. Shaw, could you speak to that? Um, for sure. And uh, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thanks for having me. I completely understand that concern. We have been through 10, 11 months of this horrible pandemic that's affected our lives, our families, our loved ones, our community. So I, de I definitely understand that. I talk to, I'm a pediatrician by training um, and I talk to my family still uh, and that fear. So I do want to acknowledge that. What we know now compared to what we know in March is completely different. We have the benefit of all across the nation, different in-person learning education occurring. And we have learned about secondary transmission for that. Secondary transmission means someone actually getting COVID-19 from school, not being positive in school and bringing it from the community. And what we know from that, plus measures that uh, DCPS in particular uh, have put in and will be putting in is that when you put in the appropriate measures, specifically mask wearing, social distancing, uh, making sure folks who are sick uh, don't, don't enter the building, you reduce secondary transmission dramatically. Uh, so it's really, if you are able to put these safety measures in place, the risk of actually having COVID-19 spread within the in-person educational setting is much lower Plus, when you're able to cohort, the risk of outbreaks actually get reduced as well. Luckily, we have a strong contact tracing and case investigation team um, at DC Health. We've been coordinating with DCPS, so we're able to react fast when uh, there is a positive in the community as well as uh, if it is in the school. So the Department of Health, our Department of Health, which um, is where the expertise is in our government, you're not from a public health perspective, you're not concerned about uh, reopening schools if the right precautions are taken, precautions that have been stated. Yeah. Yes. Now, you mentioned uh, about looking at the experience across the country. There was a witness who testified. I don't think you've been here the whole hearing, um, and I was told you would join late. But there was a witness who testified. She was in support of reopening. She cited studies from other countries like Italy. Are you familiar with those studies? Yes, I, I am familiar. I'm not particular with the Italy study, but other, uh, other places around the world um, have been publishing their experience uh, with in-person education. And I think what it boils down to, because even in the United States, we've had different areas of in-person education. And if you look at the lay news, you'll see outbreaks here, kind of a bad situation coming up and going out there, a great scenario somewhere else. The top line is, it's all about how you implement these measures. If you're able to layer these protective measures, such as mask wearing, social distancing, um, cohorting, then you're actually protecting the students and the staff uh, from uh, spreading COVID-19 uh, within themselves. And the more you're able to protect that, no matter what's going on outside with community spread, you're creating a safer environment there. Obviously reducing community spread makes it a lot easier for all of this to happen as well. Thank you, uh, Dr. Shah. And I'm hopeful that other members will ask you questions. Um, I have one other question and then I'm gonna reserve time so that other members have a chance. Uh, Chancellor Faraby, there was one witness, Emily Greif, who testified. And I wanna read one paragraph from her testimony and ask you to respond. Educational equity means that each child receives what they need to develop their full social and academic potential. DCPS purports to have committed prioritizing in-person learning seats for students furthest from opportunity. Yet these students are not the primary ones who will benefit from in-person learning. In data procured and supplied by DCPS, over half of families in wards five, seven, and eight preferred a virtual only option. In ward seven, that percentage was 70%. For these and many other DCPS families, an offered in-person seat is not the golden ticket that many more affluent DC residents have regarded it as, but a risk that cannot be taken during this pandemic that has so adversely affected black and brown communities. How do you, 
What do you say to that witness? So I agree that there's definitely diversity in need. There are unique needs at each school level and it varies by family and circumstances are obviously different, which is one of the reasons why we shifted from a cookie cutter approach where every school had to implement the same model for in-person programming. I think what you heard today from a lot of our, our families and staff, it, it looks different at each school. Uh, I think you also heard today that there's a need for us to consider what teachers are seeing in terms of engagement and performance uh, to offer seats to students and families, which we've done. Uh, but it's also important to note that of the families who've already accepted a seat, for example, by elementary age student, 43% of those students represent students that have been designated at risk. So we are meeting the needs of those students that we know uh, may have had pre-existing gaps in performance while also giving schools the ability to identify other students who may need to be prioritized given their current performance or engagement or academic or social emotional needs during this time. Thank you. I'm gonna reserve my time and turn to other members. Uh, for 10 minute rounds, Councilmember Gray. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, uh, I've enjoyed listening to the uh, witnesses uh, all afternoon uh, who testified uh, on, <clears throat> excuse me, the reopening uh, plans. I think we've had almost every uh, position imaginable uh, shared with us at one point or another. Some say we shouldn't reopen, some say we should. Uh, we've had lots of testimony about, um, you know, uh, having, having folks uh, be instructed, our children be instructed outside uh, in the open air. Uh, it's just a variety of uh, approaches that we've heard, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, the, um, let me just share some of the, you know, just, just following this along, you know, over time myself. Um, let, me, let me go to my notes. Um, where where most, plan, most of the plans or plans uh, are to move uh, uh, to in-person classroom were intended to be in phases, if I'm correct, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman and to uh, the chancellor. Uh, it appears that now the plan is to open up uh, in-person learning to all grade levels in DCPS schools. Is that a correct interpretation, uh, Chairman Fairby? Yeah, so uh, I want to be clear. Yes, Council Chancellor Fairby, go right ahead. Yeah, I want to be clear, really clear, Council McGray, that it has been a very phased approach. We started back in October with what we call student support centers. So these were schools that wanted to get started with in-person programming and also outdoor programming. It's also important to note that mm -hmm. during the conversation today that one of those uh, beginning points was an outdoor space initiative, uh, which we've continued to do and schools have continued to ramp up. We've also added more opportunities as time went on. So we added our care model uh, in November, and we also gave schools the opportunity to begin in-person learning where there were teachers uh, who were willing to volunteer and we had a critical mass to support students and families. From there, we want to expand to serving more students in person, particularly with our teacher. And we also want to expand beyond elementary. Right now, the majority of our services in person are for elementary age students. So beginning mm -hmm. term three, the expectation is we serve both elementary and middle school and high school students. Um, if, if I'm correct, and I may or may not be, you correct me if, I'm, if it's different than what I'm saying. Um, it sounds, sounds to me like you've had, you've having, you're having available a suite of four different models um, from which individual schools can choose. Um, at the elementary level is model A, um, where one teacher instructs uh, one cohort uh, all week. Uh, model B, uh, where one teacher instructs uh, in person and virtually uh, all week. Uh, oftentimes that's with uh, support staff. Then the third model, model C, where two teachers rotate uh, to instruct uh, two ways uh, two days, excuse me, in, in person and three days virtually. And then model D, model the fourth model, where one teacher instructs uh, two cohorts of students uh, uh, in, in person and uh, virtually. Is that 
Is that a correct interpretation of where we are, uh, Dr. Farabee? Yeah, well, those are guardrails that we provided to schools, but they're not restricted to those four models. It's important to note that we have uh, four models for elementary and we have four models for secondary because the needs are very different for our older students. Schools can write outside, draw outside the lines in those four models. And so there are variations of those models that are being implemented. We wanted schools to ground in what we believe are those best practices for in-person programming. Mm -hmm. But there are schools that have unique variations. For example, there are 10 elementary schools that have a AM PM model where a group of students come in the morning and another group of students come in the afternoon. Uh, there's one school, for example, JNA Elementary that's offering lunch clubs for students that are in their upper grades. And then Tyler Elementary School is offering outdoor gardening club for students as well. So it will look very different for each campus. And again, I wanna re re just emphasize and reiterate that we wanted schools to be creative and be in a position to be the most responsive as possible to the needs of their school communities and their families. Can, can, can you tell us what the science uh, is, what the evidence was formed the basis uh, for creating and setting forth um, the, the models, the four models that you all have adopted uh, at this point? Yeah, we did a deep dive into best practices for in-person learning during the health emergency, learning from other school districts, learning what works well for students at each level, and then adapting that to DCPS, and also what we heard from our teachers and our principals around what they wanted to see happen in their schools, what they believe would best serve their students and families. Thus, we created uh, these options for schools to begin their planning on, but obviously they could create something else that would be a variation of what we presented. Have all the schools now made and reported to you, reported to your, your office, the choices um, that they have made of which models of the four you have out there and of which models they are choosing to pursue uh, with their student body uh, at this stage? Yes, uh, all schools have completed the planning process with their reopening community core teams that has created models for their school. But I also want to be really clear that those models are very fluid. As offers are made to families for in-person programming, as staffing is made based on those offers and acceptance of seat, a school could change. Um, they could have one less third grade classroom than they anticipated. Um, they may find that they needed to, uh, instead of having to focus on chemistry and biology, they may shift the focus on career and technical education at a high school based on student interest and demand. So uh, they have an overall structure and blueprint uh, that they have approved to work from. However, we wanted them to be nimble and make adjustments as needed. So what, what, what the, the models that are now you know, being selected from by the uh, schools involved, is that information readily available to us on the council? Yeah, so we've made available to the council and the public what the planning models are at the elementary and secondary level. Schools are still in the process of offering seats and confirming seat acceptance. Once that process is complete this week, we will have a summary report of where schools have landed in their final status for reopening plans for term three. So um, the schools, are, even at this stage, they're still working through what the models are that they're going to offer to their students. Is that right, Dr. Therapy? Well, so they have their models, but we wanted to give them space to make modifications to their models if needed based on seat offers and acceptance. So we give families a time period to respond to a seat offer. Uh, so some of our seat offers are pending. Uh, as families accept seat or not, that could yield a change in a school's model. And so we know to date what their plan models are. However, we want to give them time to confirm their models before we communicate out publicly what the summary data will be for term three reopening plan. So that process will be complete this week. Uh, once that process is complete, we'll report out specifically what the models are for each school 
uh, as relates to their final plans for implementation. How will you be reporting that information to the wider public, you know, the families and the children, you know, who are being served by DCPS? So schools have already communicated their reopening plans to their school community. So each principal has shared with their school community what their blueprint is. Uh, once that is confirmed after the seat offer process is complete, all of that information will be available on our Reopening Strong website. That is where we will roll up the overall summary and that is where we house the current models that schools use to plan from. Okay. Mr. Chairman, my time is virtually up uh, on, on this round. Um, I would actually hope that you would give us a chance to convene um, some of the folks that we heard from today and maybe others uh, to talk about um, their thoughts, you know, on, on what the uh, options are and how now they feel about the uh, school uh, reopening plan. Uh, I, I want to make, if there's another round, Mr. Chairman, I do want to come back and ask Dr. Shaw uh, some questions as well, but my time is up on this round, so thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah, and I will uh, see if we can squeeze in another round. Um, next is uh, Councilmember Treon White. Yes, thank you. Uh, hello, Dr. Furby. Um, I want to welcome you to this hearing. Uh, I know that you've been paying attention to some of the previous testimonies. Um, one of the gentlemen stated that he has been participating in a number of conversations and giving input, and he feels like DCPS leadership uh, no matter what the people say, just isn't listening. How do you respond to several concerns or comments like that as the leader of the public school system for DC? Good evening, Council Member White. Yeah, we, we welcome input and feedback. And again, our new process for term three was rooted in grassroots input and feedback from family members, our, our staff, and those working in the school community. They really helped drive and inform the plans for each school to develop their reopening uh, plans for students and families. So uh, their input is reflected in that. I know sometimes uh, we don't have the opportunity or it's not feasible to incorporate every idea and every thought. Uh, and sometimes there are points of disagreement uh, and principals have to work through uh, the challenge of incorporating that feedback and creating a plan that reflects uh, the needs of that school and that community. And we believe confidently our principals have done that. So let me ask you this. Um, we've seen, uh, I mentioned this earlier, uh, some national data where 400,000 people tested, I mean, died, I mean, I say tested positive, died as a result of COVID-19. And we've seen uh, of that 25% uh, died in the last, uh, in, in December, right? So the numbers are going up. Uh, what about that data are you using to encourage you to open schools and start the process in two weeks? Well, we continue to lean on the expertise and the guidance from, from DC Health, which is also aligned to the guidance uh, from CDC. Uh, we continue to lean on our strategies to mitigate transmission. Uh, we continue to lean on our health and safety commitments, which is a layer of uh, protections for students and staff, which includes... So, Dr. Furby, yes. based on that, you getting this information from those experts, is that data leading you to, like, now is the time? That's what I'm trying to understand. Yeah, we, we have all indication that now is the time. Um, we recently heard from President Biden today an essential urgency to reopen schools as, as quickly as possible. Uh, and based on our own a survey uh, of our data, uh, we believe it's appropriate at this time and it represents what we know about the science. We also recently received additional reports from the American Association of Pediatrics that also recommend to continue to reopen with schools and that schools are not uh, contributing to uh, transmission in the community uh, at large. It's, uh, schools, I mean, you I mean, just thinking logically, schools can't be contributing that much because schools aren't open yet, but we have to imagine where people are gathering in any type of space, it puts more people at risk, not just the students that, that are there, the teachers, uh, the administrators, but their families. And so we do have to consider that, uh, that equation, st students are not at risk now because they're at home, uh, which they are at risk, but not 
as at risk if they were in a contained environment. Uh, there were 1,254 families from Ward A who responded to your pre-K-5 um, survey. Um, of that number, 58% uh, said that they plan to keep their children uh, home, home long, learning from home. Do you have any data that identifies the primary reason for their response? And if, and if any, are you doing, what are you doing to build the confidence about those uh, who want to, or thinking about um, returning in person for instruction? Yeah, we always want to know how we can best serve families. And uh, what we hear from families is that, you know, their family circumstances are different. Uh, we have some families where uh, the parent or guardian is working from home and they can continue to provide supervision and guidance and believe that their child is performing well academically and socially uh, with our remote learning model. Uh, we also hear from parents who are not able to provide that level of supervision and support and believe that it is best for their child to have an in-person experience uh, and to be in a school building. Uh, so those experiences are going to be different by family. We also hear uh, that, you know, families want to continue to provide as much academic support at home because their student is experiencing success. And we want that success to continue. But the reality is not all of our students are experiencing success with learning at home. And that's where we see interest uh, and need and demand. And we want to be responsive to that demand accordingly. So, so from my understanding, the in-person learning in the classroom is going to be about 11 people in the classroom, right? Yeah, it, it will vary by a grade level. Okay. Uh, so so the, reason younger... I, the reason why I'm asking, because I want to know from you, uh, what were uh, some of your conversations with the Washington Teachers Union as it relates to uh, teachers coming back? Because I'm hearing through social media now, I can't verify everybody who's just saying a comment on social media, but um, that teachers are concerned about coming back in that capacity. That means that the teachers we already have that have been in training, been in our system, know our culture, uh, may, may not come back. And we're talking about classrooms that may was 22, 25, people in the classroom now got to be split. That will call some more teachers. How do we plan to ad address those type of issues? And what are we going to do with the teachers who say, I'm not ready yet, or it's not safe for me, or I have a health uh, issue? Yeah, so first of all, if, if there are, uh teachers who, who have pre-existing health conditions uh, and it's not appropriate for them to be a part of our in-person programming, uh, we definitely have accommodations available to them that they can pursue. Uh, in terms of developing our teachers, uh, we want to ensure that they understand clearly what our health and safety protocols are. We spent a lot of time on that this week and throughout our planning periods to ensure that staff is well-versed on our health and safety protocols and what to expect in in-person programming. Uh, as you can imagine, what you heard today is there are many opinions about what safe is and what safe isn't. Uh, and we obviously have heard that from our teachers. However, we've had many teachers who have volunteered uh, to work in person and have done so uh, in a fashion that has been very safe uh, and effective for both them and their students. And we anticipate we'll continue to have that. Uh, we also have teachers who uh, have um, had some fears and we had to be responsive to those fears and we'll continue to be responsive to that. We also heard from teachers who are very much so interested in uh, receiving a vaccine and we work very closely with DC Health and Children National uh, to provide that vaccine uh, beginning next week and so we want to continue to be responsive. Can I ask you a question? Right. My time is ticking, Doc. Uh, uh, you talked, you brought up the issue of vaccines. Uh, have all the teachers been tested uh, will they be tested within the next two weeks when school start? Just know who uh, is positive and not and, and non reactive. Yeah, so we we've sent a preliminary email to our employees working in person about the process for vaccination, and they'll receive. Did your answer yes? Because you said yeah. I don't know. Yes, they have. Yet. They have. Okay. They have received uh, indication of what to expect for the vaccination, and that will begin next week. And those vaccinations will take place at Dunbar High School. Thank you. Um, I have a few moments left. Um, you said that DC Health, I'm trying to read exactly what you said. I don't want to misquote you. DC Health anticipates beginning vaccine distribution for staff working at education facilities on the week of January 25th. Um, given, given that this is the only and anticipated date, what is the plan for vaccines does not become available? Um, because I'm li listening, hearing on a mayor's call that there's a shortage. 
Yeah, so this this isn't the only date. There are multiple dates during the week of the 25th. So there's a date on the 26th, uh, January 28th, January 29th, and also January 30th as well uh, to provide the vaccine to employees that are working in person. They'll receive a personal invite to schedule their appointment on those dates that have been provided. Um, you uh, There were 79 DCPS location offerings in person programming selected. How did you all come up with these particular locations? Yeah, so those were our care programming uh, locations or schools that uh, volunteered uh, to be a part of pilot for in-person programming. Uh, and that was determined by interest in their school for uh, in-person programming and also primarily the staffing available. Uh, we relied a lot on staff that were volunteering or partners. So I know uh, Councilman Allen asked about you know where the partners fit in this. Many of our before and after school care partners have um, been able to support us in supporting the care model uh, and being adults in the classroom that are supervising students that are learning remotely while they're doing so in the school building. All right, where do you stand on um, learning outside learning? Because that, that's been part of the heavy part of the conversation. Yeah, so I'm supportive. I don't see it as a panacea, though, as it's been presented by many other today. Uh, I think there there isn't one solution, silver bullet to all of the challenges that we're trying to overcome with this pandemic. I think it's going to require a multitude of approaches. Uh, so those schools that are interested, we will support them. We've had more schools uh, take on elements of of outdoor learning, for example, uh, Mann Elementary, Burroughs Elementary, Janney Elementary, uh, Duke Ellington, Orsted Adam, Noise. So there, there are schools that are implementing elements of that and we'll support them accordingly. However, we know that, and this has been brought up today, that there are challenges with weather. Uh, at some point, you do have to go inside um, to use things like the restroom or uh, meals served inside buildings. And so uh, we want to ensure that our buildings reflect our health and safety protocols, and that's where we've invested a lot of our resources. Thank you, uh, Councilmember White. The, as I said before, we're trying for a second round. Councilmember Lewis George. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm going to start with uh, Dr. Shaw. Um, uh, Dr. Shaw, um, today the mayor announced that there were there will be 3,900 doses available for DCPS in-person staff next week. Uh, given the shortages we've seen in doses and appointments so far, how confident are we that this is a guaranteed number? Hi, um, thank you for the question. So those doses um, are guaranteed because we wait to actually know the allocation before putting any appointment on the books. Perfect. Um, the mayor's situational update today uh, said D.C. is getting 8,775 doses of the Pfizer vaccine and 5,600 doses of the Moderna vaccine. Are second doses included in these numbers? Uh, yes. Yeah, so these are all first doses only. All second doses, though not reported at a frequent basis, come automatically with every first dose shipment to the same provider around two to three weeks after. Okay. And, and I know you spoke a lot about uh, other states and looking at other states. I, I wanna particularly take a look at our region because it seems that uh, regional coordination is a huge issue, especially since we have teachers uh, uh, and staff who have children in other uh, regions. So Alexandria City Public School, for example, has said uh, they'll stay virtual 100% if daily case rates are above 50 per 100,000 residents. Montgomery County has set their bar at 15 cases per 100,000 residents. What is DC's metric for when it's safe to open schools? Is there a level of community spread that, that isn't safe for us? Um, thanks, for, thanks for the question. You actually bring up a, a good point in that there's so much diversity, not only in our region, but across the nation. Um, there's areas in which there's in-person school occurring safely with the low secondary transmission when there is um, even higher or uptick of community spread. And I, I do just wanna reiterate the point of, it's all about what safety measures that are in place that help protect the school community. So I, I apologize, I don't have a specific number. It's really about looking at those safety measures and then seeing how well they're implemented as well as seeing the data uh, on the ground as well. 
And we have that also, not only locally here, but then across the nation um, about schools in-person learning. Okay, so currently DC has no metric then. So like Alexandria has a metric, Montgomery County has a metric, DC has no set metric at this moment. So we have um, metrics, as you know, from coronavirus.dc.gov around uh, phase reopening, but it's not only daily case rate. There's, uh, there's about four different categories uh, to see how we're doing as a whole. And then we can make applied judgments on each sector based on the information we know from history as well as other jurisdictions. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, I have a, qu a question, uh, uh, Chancellor Therapy. Thank you for being on uh, the call. Um, I wanted to first uh, ask a question about right now, how many students have tested positive in the last two weeks? Yeah, so I, I can give you a summary view of our cases. Uh, the last two weeks are a little bit uh, murky in that we haven't had school for the last three days. Uh, and of course, we've, we've had some holidays, but cumulatively, uh, we've had approximately 20 students who tested positive uh, in in-person programming. Um, uh, 13 of those positive cases were as a result of our asymptomatic testing protocols. And then seven of those positive cases were as a result of our uh, positive case reporting to staff from families directly. Okay. Um, and I know you uh, stated earlier um, that uh, when uh, during Mr. Gray, uh, Council Member's Gray time, um, I know that you guys don't have models decided yet. So how are you making seat offers for teacher teaching assignments if you don't have a model decided yet? Yeah, thank you for that question, uh, Council Member George. So it's, it's, a, it's a unique process in which we started with the blueprint uh, that the school will be implementing. And then we've identified staff that is aligned to that blueprint. Based on seat offers and acceptance, we could modify the blueprint for that school or the staffing. So once seat offers are complete, we may go back and tweak the staffing assignments or the blueprint for that school. And once that's complete, then staffing assignments will be done and then schools will receive their schedules and communicate that to families. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Um, I did have a question about uh, with our teachers. What happens if someone doesn't show up for their in-person teaching assignment? Will, will they be uh, considered terminated? Yeah, so we always wanna understand uh, the circumstances for our employees. Uh, so the, the principal or the supervisor for that individual uh, would typically reach out to better understand uh, the person's situation and why they're not able to report to work. It may be a scenario where uh, the person may need leave, access to uh, FMLA or uh, ADA accommodation. Uh, if there's no accommodation needed and the individual uh, is just choosing not to report to work, I think that's a completely different conversation that we would have uh, and we would hope the employee would choose to return to work. Okay, what, what percentage of teachers have expressed interest in returning to teach in person at this time? So we had approximately 7% of our teachers volunteer to work in person. Uh, the remaining teachers that were identified to work in person as a result of the randomized selection process that uh, Principal Takeva reference of how teachers would be selected. Uh, and then of course we consider any uh, accommodation that would be needed for those staff members and approximately uh, 1900 or 72 percent of the, the people that will be working in person are non-WTU members and then approximately 2200 uh, individuals that will be working in person which is about 45 percent uh, are WTU members for a total of 4200 staff members that would be expected to work in person. Okay and, and what is our plan for substitute teachers in that? Yeah, so schools have a strong network of substitutes that they can rely on. Uh, however, that uh, core group of substitutes is not as robust as it has been in, in, uh, in person prior to the pandemic. Uh, so we do have a little bit more limited access. However, uh, we can utilize substitutes as needed. And they have been substitutes that have been working in a remote posture as well when a teacher needs to be out. Um, I want to ask a little bit about the virtual learning. Um, uh, what training or guidance or new technology has, has central office provided for teachers 
um, who've been given these uh, simulcasting assignments of virtual and in person. Yeah, so we have provided uh, professional development for teachers, one on our health and safety measures. Uh, and then we are allowing teachers to be a part of our building walkthroughs, become familiar with the building and their workspace. And then schools that have requested technology for simulcasting, we've purchased that technology to ensure that they have the appropriate technology. And then schools are then providing professional development for teachers as needed to support them with the utilization of that technology in their building. The technology being used by schools does vary uh, from building to building. And so some schools are using uh, webcams, some schools are using document cameras to help support learning. And if there's a need for support, we provide it accordingly. Okay. And I know you have voiced your support for outdoor learning. What is What does, would it take to get the ball rolling? Do you need more funding from the council perspective? Do you have the funding? What, what is, seems to be a holdup? I know since the summer, people have been requesting this outdoor learning model. Uh, when can we expect that to be implemented by DCPS? Yeah, so we provided some resources to schools that are interested in outdoor learning. For example, we provided uh, tents to schools if they want to set up tents outside to support outdoor learning, depending upon the size of their campus. Uh, but we honestly have not had wide scale requests for resources to support outdoor learning. I think the reality is it it, it is limiting in some ways, uh, obviously due to weather and the outdoor space for campuses vary significantly throughout the district. And so we do have a concern about equity and access as relates to outdoor space as well. Uh, but we continue to uh, solicit feedback from our principals and principals have interest for resources. Uh, we will follow up uh, any needs that they may have. Um, and and, and um, because I'm running out of time, um, I know we care about reducing, and this can go to you, Dr. Shaw, as well. We care about reducing the spread of the virus among teachers working in person. So why aren't we including teachers at child care centers and private schools uh, um, in our current ro uh, rollout? I'm, I'm happy uh, to answer that one, uh, Chancellor. Um, th they are a part of our phase 1B rollout, so incredibly highly prioritized for uh, vaccination. Are they, are, they, are they with the teachers going to be able to get their va get vaccinations? So the access for them uh, will not start on 125 as with our uh, teachers serving public school students, but they are still part of the same category and the same type of prioritization. Um, and as soon as we have more vaccine and more information, uh, we will communicate how, how they're getting looped in. Okay. And, and I know I'm- I know You're I'm, out of time. There'll be a second round. Okay. Oh, that's what we're trying for. Uh, Councilmember Silverman, questions? Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good evening, uh, Mr. Chancellor and Dr. Shah. Uh, first, Mr. Chancellor, I would just want to um, take on the equity issue right away. So certainly we know we have an achievement gap between black and white students. And now in COVID, we see the surveys show a racial disparity in who wants to return to in-person learning. So families more at risk. Uh, for COVID contracting or dying from COVID, and in our city, that's Black families, do not trust DCPS is safe for their students to return in person right now. We see white families do at much higher rates. Uh, so can you uh, give us an idea, number one, what, it, what is the racial breakdown of who's returned so far? Yes, yeah, so I want to be clear that the, the differences in family choice around in-person programming, uh, I think, res is, is respectfully aligned to the family needs and their individual situations. Uh, so I don't necessarily equate that to, to trust. Uh, Mr. Chancellor, we don't have that much time, so I don't mean to be rude. But my question is, and obviously we're seeing this with the vaccine, but there's a big difference in you know, who is benefiting. Um, and we had to course correct for that at the Department of Health. Um, so I'm specifically asking you, like with Brent, Ross, and Kimball, for example, what, what are we seeing in terms of percentages of white students versus black students returning in that in-person learning pilot? Yeah, so I mean, it varies by campus. Obviously, uh, there's there are more 
uh, black students at Kimball, given their current population um, there that will be participating in person, uh, that's gonna be different at Brent. Uh, but we, we do see, and as I noted in our care classroom implementation, that the majority of students serve our students that are aligned to our prioritized groups, which includes those students that are designated at risk, uh, those students experiencing homelessness and language learners and students receiving special education services. Uh, for, our, for our term three data, uh, mm -hmm. it looks a little bit different from uh, for our in-person programming. And, and once we have uh, students assigned and, and final schedules go out, we'll continue to collect information about the demographics of those students in person. Okay, um, Mr. Chancellor, I would request data release. Uh, it would be help. I appreciated the aggregate data that you had in your testimony. It would be helpful to see it by school and as well by category, like what types of students with IEPs are coming back? Are they students with physical disabilities or you know, what kinds of disabilities uh, are we seeing students um, return to the classroom with? Because I'm told anecdotally that it's, there, there are a lot of students, a lot of families with students uh, with special needs who are just very reluctant to return uh, in, in person right now. So let me ask you this, can we get uh, more granular data? Uh, yeah, we're to provide that data. Again, we're, we're finalizing seats. I can tell you from our care model, 60% uh, mm -hmm. of the students in person are black, 30% uh, are white, and then 3% are American Indian or uh, Alaskan Native. And then uh, they're 1% Asian and 1% uh, Native Hawaiian or Pacific. Okay, that that would be helpful helpful to get, and if we can get any further breakdown, um, I'd appreciate that. I'm going to move to a, something else, Mr. Chancellor. So, um, you 1,000 students are in the care classroom. You said on February 1st you hope to go to 4,000. Is that correct? And and expand up to 15 by the end of term three. It, am I understanding your testimony correctly? Yeah, so I was given the numbers for seat acceptance for term three. So we have, and, and this number is moving, is counting. We have uh, approximately 3,100 students who've already accepted a seat at the elementary level. Uh, we have approximately 2,200 students at the secondary level that accepted a seat. And we have the capacity to serve approximately 15,000 students. Okay, so my point, Mr. Chen, and we have about 50,000 students in DCPS, is that correct, altogether? That is correct. So a majority of, okay, so that means that two out of three students, even if you reach your ceiling on in-person learning, are still going to be learning virtually, correct? That would be correct. Because Okay. So that's the question I haven't heard an answer to, which is since the vast majority of our students are going to be learning virtually, and we hear repeated, so we, I hear two things. I hear reluctance of, to come back to the classroom, students and families, you know, depending, and it, it is, does seem to break down by race, uh, a discomfort with returning to the classroom or a, a, a lack of trust that their health is is in welfare is going to be safeguarded. Um, but then I also hear frustration with virtual learning in that it's not working for a lot of students. And that's not the fault of the teacher. It's just that this is, you know, a, a learning model that we weren't equipped at the beginning of, you know, this last year to do. Uh, well, so how are we improving virtual learning for the two thirds of DCPS students that are still going to be learning virtually, even in terms three and likely four? Yeah, so I want to be really clear that the majority of students that are in our current in person programming are, are black students. Uh, secondly, I want to be clear that we continue to invest in the development of our teachers on how to improve.